من كنف دكتور بنتي نو منك سجراتن اوتو سغنتات سيني وان غدا ويتو يادا ويجرا او سسنا نو فداتني سدبو دا نم بيك سيسا كوبي تي سينا جيچو دكتور بنتي جيرتو بنتي انساني سنجران نتفكاتا كيسو ما نتو كوسن دفني ميت قطر تقول داي قالمان توك ايه اغاسيغا غاستانان يا دسا وليب سنا تقوب سني تينا يام ستي نغا ول غافدا اكما ادا كينياتي يرو ارغا بريسيتان كوانت ولو بچيبنو افان نغاتين افان قجيلا دان امسا ارغا دبرسون برباسي سادا يرو غري غري وانتوني سينسيتيف تان انا نتي دفني Amalatin kaban tol fachum barbasa itu la case case Kenya akitua kaban akitina mata som nomor tesa itu ijat eh kanab yero barresinu yero dubanu ergang Kenya nama sana berat ake wan barban wakar ganu titau kaba itu la akma kan ada kan agud fachum garida yero unduma yani walfakata injiratu namne sadarka dada kaba isanu fakannes Opsine agai fanny, ya ada sahati, Dewi kenu ada gua cung garit, aim baik tan je cung miti, walu baci sur umafi, edun kesan baik tu tak hayota, kanu gudif tani, simfundura tenye nak kasih ti asomnu, by esin bonna, kapsono romo, galisa gawu antagasi itu aku jolle gudif tani asin nuge esan itu doktor mama, doktor, doktor, doktor Asal saja kita doktor Asfa untuk kesanu wan tu guia guia anggotan uji gudara bikin tu ni mau yero era boda bu abu sak uji konati aku margi tani isini mau nan ujawata ada kuenis ada nanje di jana nanje tani fina ada jeda wali nasum ni rakan adua doktor Trevor Truman warga gara sodoma jalaga dan isani ni Unna be 96 ya kau ropa tin be kai ron refu gazit esu majel kabe segala hara akan jadi mobil jalan ranu tergutur ani aku no valin teh nyu jenna undi ke sanu wan tu sinu jatta wangari ta edu ba ye galat Thomas sinin jenna cura yo ke sumon ni ke nyu fani daki kani ke nami ba ide majira ti fufu dan de nyamu akam jatu me Obat asal le guru nu bus, doktor Banti Malta ada. Nanti juga saya jumpa mo. Oh, saya nani ru doktor Banti ni sari ya fajar treyu. Bagi naga nuftan doktor Banti. Bagi naga nuftan saya tak. Silkinan tu masa aku ini bilu dah cerita kacau tu resa harga cut abe. Eh, otong sa ganta tin seni akai ada no go no go tu mau sa ganta be eksis seni dura go tu. Kila no seni kenu. Segal, thole galu bi sa mu en hingira ni lu bi as Ismailif an nami tu baju dan dia. Jadi enggak apa dah, kalau itu itu ifal wanita. Eh, ni kau pada. Tole kan ulama tu tu baca tak? Wah, kita tak ke samu bawa kalan. Jira jira. Okay, baik gari. Eh, kita besi saat ini senua ya, nanti pak ada bawa. Awas. Aye, aye besi sen sada boleh sen tu fayat awal fata. Gabah bina nafan romoti ni. Koping Kenya kan hari aku konferensi aku kan kalesa itu fufeda buaya kalesa orang mo human rights group kan jadi amu garin hara jar miota orang mo mereka nama marat ojatan afuri nunde fami erojal kabah kuali itu fufe wan ojat cut amaluk buaya kalesa sejra isan nabra gara fundra sinubacihna Oromia Global Forum ini walaupun kun akan nukar gaya mukalesa nukar gare atau nukar gare rai dua galat efah cuba berbana inar aku ni 
imu makanan ka wal qabate ke sumota afere jira ke sumon kenya panali agagesu asirratti wanti ifsu barbanu warri inu dubatu jenne nuti tala itergne gafanne sababota gara gara tin aske sat hirmachu akam barbanne ifsaniru toko ad arfase gamada dawarra jawar mamada kashin ke summa kabaja tate dufte nu dubat ke nu finar gamne akasmas yasin juma kan gazitesan biya kenya biya kenya ne achit ame ture mutanno sa kanu hipsu sa fere fere inni ni nargam ke summon ni bira kampanali da fa fere man argamaniru isan in ingalate fanna yero wan kana tigagesinu yero biyi ke nyara ko gara gara ke sajiru guya guya dan wan heduna mayades wan heduna matti dagamu yero dagen ke satti koppi kana kan gagesinu atawti wan ti gurgudda lamanu fundura jira oromian ummanni oromo akkasan nagar gatani ti fufan gochun dirqamanu rajiru da mirgi saba ke nyammo bakka jirut akka egamu kabachi sufi ratto jechu suji kay jira ikan kana janne milke sufi mo walit ufne humna qamnun bi kunta qamnun wa qamnu jabe sine ho jechu nu barbachi sa oji walit ufani jabat jabe sani ujetani mo hirmanna saba ke nya gafata irmanna saba ke nya akka kana dura wante ratti hima fi dubbacha de mo ton tane wan dubbani ke sawano jirra olu dandaw o jitti hi kurrat ti ye fatu akka tawu fi e akka ta wa ti kamnu kan approachin itti de nu gara fundura akka kana taw ka walu bacci e u bacci sa jirru bu ya kana ke sumo nargama ne du gala to ma jenna isa kana ngabaf se afan ingliffa an ifte gara e ko pike nyatti se na jechu Dear our respected guests welcome to our today's Oromia Human Rights uh, Group uh, forum it is our privilege to have you all here this forum is unique for some specific reasons what is we are conducting this forum when our country is at extreme risk and in the loop of political crisis second human rights violations in oromia and the rest of the country are at its climax than ever we experience sir we hear day and night the lack of peace and stability and no one is certain at this stage where this can lead us or we are facing to immediate need to improve the continued existence of our Oromo nation and to ensure that human rights are properly five the achievement of these goals is requires an active and effective collaboration and for a collaboration to be active and effective it requires a strong and active participation this forum is also impressive as we have three respected and the distinguished guests among us ambassador herman kon former assistant secretary of state for africa mr william Dav davidson founder and editor of ethiopian insight and the senior analyst for ethiopia international crisis professor asfa bayena from the san diego university a president of oromo studies association from 2005 to 2006 so it is not only we hold a forum and the discuss but we expect to discuss what we can do next after this forum to make it easier for you to follow us let me introduce then our today's running program from 10 to 10 to 12 13 we will be having a panel discussion with these prominent guests now i before I call up on Dr. Trevor Truman, Director of Oromia Support Group, I, I, would, I would like to invite Dr. Banti Ujulu to remember our recently passed pastor. We, we are sorry daily we heard this, uh, uh, this story. Yesterday we have remembered five young Oromos who have murdered in Nakamte. Today, Yesterday night, one of the, uh, the Orthodox uh, pastor who advocate for Oromo language in the Orthodox system was murdered by unknown group. 
So it is important to remember this person at this stage. So I would like to invite Mr. Banti Ujulu to, rem to remember and give some uh, silence for our audience. Thank you. Thank you, Abasa, for your uh, invitation. It's a sad news that we are, we are having. Uh, I will try to shift from English because our English uh, speakers who do not speak Afan Oromo have heard. So I will ask uh, to remember our brother and priest, Etros Tasfai, killed yesterday in Sabata town, close to Addis Ababa or Finfinne. As we heard, is he was brutally killed and found dead in uh, somewhere outside. So, Amakana is in Gafatu, Gabar Sitani, Haji Ismail, Sheikh Ismail, if you're Babakana, Baye Gabar Sitani, Yadatu, Wakayun. Kanafi, Matisanafi, Yasanafi, by Egabastan Yadra, Yeronka Nuante, if he, a Boba Dura, Haj smiling and not Tanzibo Bacala and Mochuanich. Payata Alhamni La Sala to a Salam, Lara Sula, Wada, and he was serving on Wada. By E. Oduga disease, by E. One Noga disease, Waka Bratva, Egi Bamad, Namanagatoko, Sababah to Kumale, Adjason. Akanama, Nemabia la Farra, Yurunduma, Pitetila Kama, what a great Altoko, Ibera Ergamara Bitrani, Saban Sanito, Kokanisan or Dof Sambrate, Ergamara Bid, and Ammanum to Kuruna Samu to a Tamingo eye, and Nanite, Etila to Kailan, Yona Leo, Hilul Takailan, Yona Jesuna, Ganati the Tailan, Yoan Mosa Jesuna, and Mo. Abidali Tidan, Kanafi, Tristan and Yeru, Islam and Yeru, Wakafata and Yeru, Oromo Kanduaj, Hakasarati, Hakikuni, Wakabrati, Ibati, Furatamada, one Waki Janda Tuda, Kangoni Malay, one Waki Jibu, one Goni Hinjiru, Kanafi, Dutina Michakana, by Iseba is in what this is a Wakabrati, Furatama, Miti, Warisa Jesemu, Dubuna Michakanati, Lafratis. Waka Bratis, Gafatamu Ademu, one half of Mitipun. Canabe cook up. Canabe cook up. Canafi, Isani Himo, Igisani Puni, Mata Oromofi, Igabil Sumakata, Gutumati, Nun, Furana, Waka Bratisimo, Iga Ajawaka Gutu, Angaiti, Akasiti Furatama, Canafi, Galatisa, Bilisumas of Oromata Unger. Babakala, unmute to Gara. Payata, come your tundi case and Baganagan Walorgine, Rugarumati, Gadda Gudada, Umata Kenyara, Kanjuru, be our mea case, Kanjuru, Gadda Gudada, Namni Kenya Umajra, Ega Wango, Hinkamnu, Wakayo, Wara. Uh, ume kana warra adu e kana waka yu janna tanafsi sana janna ta hagal shu uh, ega akka umma ta tokko ti uh, namni tokko yoro uh, challu majede ufe nama ajje su uh, akka umma ta tisa ta u akka inyu tisa ta u uh, nama nama ajje su sana ta ani ila alu ni sivri miti uh, waka yu kan si ajje su challu majede ta i ila ali hinje du Kamurga case, I make Kamurga case rough for the Tate of Fesi Ajusana of Raticola do of Rajes Yada, Kanam Yogo Temo, Chubu Hinkabu, Kanafi, Gutumarumati, Uman Oromo, Lafara do Gugamajra, Buleka Edu Ajra, Ijole in Jeru Jar Sen Jeru, Kanuaka Katu, Kani Abaman Tihin Jeru, Munikan at Umajra, Kan Uman Oromo, Kae Chime of Ra, it is to Irajira Male. Chalu majede ilalun Ibrahim Juru kan kawe kabate ufesi ajese ati makawa kati itiya uti chalu majede du injuru kawe kabatu ufra Davisi ufra itisi ufra kolatu jera wa kayusu kara akama akanu yamanuti kanafi umani urumo 
yoo tokko ta'e dhaabate male isa amma irratti bubbe hidate dufe la farra isa fitqa yoo kana a ta ilalun hinjiru amma si ana abba amanti hinjedu jolle hinjedu jarsa hinjedu kan umu hundumtu urumma dan kan numa jiru kana fi ummani urumo walduka ka yedabate kan ufra fitutu irrajira ufra qolachutu irrajira male cal jenne teenya akka kana ndura ufilalun hinjiru walilalun hinjiru ummani kenya tokko ta e ka yedabachutu irrajira yo kana gone male rakina amma ke sayuru kana ke sabau hindande nyu kana fi ya ummata urumo kaada badda ufratti qoladda ufratti lola wan isin itrufe wan qab dan qaba qabati ufratti lola ufrada dem sisa male chaljetani ta tesani hin ilalina kanuma kan jechu dandaw yo kana gone male duga dumatti jirachu da fin dande nyu jirachu da fimo wan nutti dufe sana hunduma humna nis kan ta'u humna ufrada de bisutu nurajira obulesa kenya kalesa kani nabsen sadar be kuni orumma satini kanini do male amanti miti amanti ortodoxi ti kanin nga gesu utu duguma amanti ta eti jarri warre ati sabisi kanuma kan sanje chajirani kana fi ummani kenya ke ufra eti sutu irajiran jira kanuma jira fayata paka yo gofta buki sani sina gar si sani kadada nisin dosani duga in rikita duga ke jalla ta jira nama ke nyadu ma jira Uga ke ni bakke no basi iga angala o iga naga ati no falmi sabake ni yadak gutuma biya ke ni yadak naga ke no ken mata go ta yesusi amen we have remembered our uh, brother uh, uh, priest tasfa petros tasfa who was killed uh, yesterday in Sabata, uh, we believe that uh, his assassination is illegal and it is ungodly act. So those of you who have uh, remembered him, uh, his family, thank you very much. May God bless you. We will continue with our seminars. Thank you. Okay. All right. Okay, edu galatoma warinu ya datani. Thank you very much. Now uh, directly I got uh, I call up on Dr. Trevor Truman, uh, director of Oromia Support Group to take the floor and uh, lead us for forum for us. Uh, thank you very much for attending all of you. Dr. Trevor. Thank you very much, Davesa. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Banti and others for the commemorative act that we've just witnessed. Thank you. I will not uh, repeat uh, what we said yesterday about the formation of the Aromia Human Rights Group and how important and, and timely it is. Uh, but briefly, just for those who were not here yesterday, the, the Human Rights Group is an amalgamation of five organizations, the Aromia Support Group uh, in the UK and the one in Australia. Aromo Menschen Rechts und Hilfs Organization in Germany, Aromo Human Rights and Relief Organization, and uh, the Human Rights League for the Horn of Africa, which uh, now has an office in Finfine as well as in Toronto, and also in uh, Uganda, and advocacy for Aromo. Now, these five organizations have realized that uh, their limited effect, although real was only small uh, prior uh, to the current situation but the current need for improved information gathering and dissemination improved relationships with the media and better uh, public awareness of the the atrocities going on in ethiopia are absolutely vital now And we, because the, the political and human rights situation in Ethiopia, which began on a very progressive and positive path in, um, in 2018, is, is now being seriously derailed. And we're seeing atrocities at a level that have not been seen really since the, the Red Terror of 1977-78. 
and in addition to the killings uh, of which the Oromi support group has gathered testimony to thousands of people being killed um, we in addition to the killings we are seeing a breakdown in law and order which is very symptomatic of, of impending chaos the we haven't seen the um, the imprisonment of judges to the extent that it's going on now we've not seen that for any time during the TPLF years for example and the the methods of torture that are being employed are far cruder than those employed by the TPLF and we're seeing a more indiscriminate approach to killings in terms of bystanders innocent bystanders being killed and even frivolously used to target practice We haven't seen since the days of the Red Terror young men being taken out of police custody by soldiers and taken to military camps and summarily executed, their bodies left in the bush, or tortured to death. And we've certainly not seen it on the degree that, that it's occurring currently. So there is a great need for better um, information dissemination and gathering and to raise awareness of what's going on in Ethiopia. I really feel the media have let us down in terms of alerting the international community of the atrocities that are occurring there. And one of the aims of the Human Rights Group is to raise awareness, as I say, and to inform our public and the greater public of, uh, of what's going on. And this is precisely what we're aiming to do today. We're very honored to have three um, experts in their fields to uh, talk about and to be questioned upon the, the reasons at root cause for the current political and human rights crisis in Ethiopia and their suggested uh, ways forward for getting out of this quagmire uh, if we're going to prevent a Somali style uh, descent into chaos. So what uh, the format is going to take place is that uh, each of the speakers will give a two or three or five minute dissertation presentation rather on uh, what they think those root causes are and the best ways forward and then there will be questions which have been prepared by members of the uh, organizations which um, organized this uh, conference for about half an hour or so and then we will have questions from the the wider audience people who are attending the conference okay so first of all i would like to call upon ambassador herman cohen who uh, has spent 38 years in the u.s foreign service and um, including being ambassador to Senegal and uh, the Gambia from uh, a period in the 1980s. And then he was assistant, sorry, from 1977 to 1980. And then assistant secretary of state for Africa from 1989 to 1993. He served in five African countries and served twice in France. After retiring in 1993, he established Cohen and Woods International in 1994 and has been advising on Africa ever since then. He's a member of the Afri American Academy of Diplomacy and on the advisory panel on the Foreign Relations Committee. And what I didn't know, he has the French Légion d'honneur awarded to him for his time in France. So Ambassador Cohen, would you kindly um, step up to the plate and give us your take on the current um the root causes for the current political and human rights crisis in ethiopia and best ways forward thank you very much well thank you for inviting me i I've, I've always had a, a great fondness for ethiopia and I, it was my great honor to preside over the uh ending of the war between eritrea and Ethiopia 
in uh, 1990, 1991. Uh, and I think the Eritrea experience uh, can lead us to some ideas as to why we're having a problem now in, with human rights in Oromia. Uh, Ethiopia is a very large country with very diverse population similar to the United States, similar to South Africa, similar to Nigeria. And it seems to me in such a country, the only logical form of government is decentralized so that there's maximum power uh, owned uh, by local peoples. For example, in the United States, the US Constitution gives certain powers to the federal government. Washington. And the Constitution has a clause that said all powers not granted to the central government belong to the individual states. So what does that mean? Well, policing, for example, the central government of the United States does not have police who can take care of crime and other problems within the individual. This all belongs to the individual states. And when I advised uh, Nelson Mandela in South Africa, after they were coming out of the apartheid system, I said to him, look, you should have maximum power at the local level. And he was very amusing. He said, you know, those people in Port Elizabeth in the Southeast, they don't trust the people in Johannesburg. So you're absolutely right. And this is what was adopted by uh, South Africa, a, uh, a federal system. And I think the same holds true for Ethiopia. The people in Addis Ababa who run the central government should not be telling the people in Oromia how to deal with crime or any other policing issues or taxes issues. Each diverse ethnic group or whatever you call it, a religious group or cultural group should be master of its own local governmental uh, issues. And I think this holds true for... For Ethiopia. The best experience so far in Ethiopia was the 10-year federation between Eritrea and, and Ethiopia. It worked very well. Eritrea had its own parliament, it had its own police, and all sorts of local government. In 1962, someone whispered in the ear of uh, the emperor and said, look, there, Eritrea, three million people. Ethiopia, 40 million people. How is it possible that they are equal to us in the federal system? This is unacceptable. So the emperor listened to them, sent his troops to Asmara, poked their guns into the parliament, and that was the end of the federation. Eritrea became a province, and that started a 29-year war. And I remember when we were ending that war, we had a meeting in London, and there was a there was the Eritrean Liberation Front, there was the Tigrayan People's Liberation Front, and there was the Oromo Liberation Front. And when we were talking about the future of Ethiopia, we agreed that Eritrea would wait three years and then have a referendum. Do they want to stay in Ethiopia? Or do they want to be independent? And at the end, the Oromo representative, who had been very quiet throughout this meeting, his name was was Lencho. He raised his hand and said, we want a referendum also. And so I, I kind of look back now and I kick myself and I say, why didn't we listen to him? We, so I said, we've been meeting here for a whole week in London. We've reached these conclusions. Now you're coming up with this request for a referendum. It's too late. We have to go on. So we went on and then, uh, and the rest is history. And the OLF, by not listening to the OLF, I think we made a big mistake. So basically, why is it that we're having a problem? Over-centralized central government, which tries to control everything in the provinces and does not recognize cultural differences, ethnic differences, linguistic differences. So the answer, it seems to me, is maximum decentralization, giving maximum power to the local governments, whereas the central government controls defense, foreign policy, monetary affairs, and trade. 
And that is all. And that is my recommendation uh, for Ethiopia. Thank you. Ambassador Cohen, that will be music to many Aromo ears to hear that. Thank you very much. Um, how would you say your opinion of the Aromo has changed in the last three decades since your meeting with Lencio Lata? Well, I think uh, a sense of uh, aromoness has grown. Uh, the, more, the more people in Addis try to exercise control, and it's amazing what happens in Addis. First, you have the emperor uh, wanting control. Then you had the derg, uh, which exercised maximum control. And then you have now uh, the current regime. Well, the EPRDF was similar. I remember my friends in... Uh, in the Agaden, telling me that under the EPRDF, and they would have a local election in the Agaden, they said, we knew the results of the election one week before the actual election. We saw the results. So, so somebody else was, had the power there. And no, so this is, in a country like Ethiopia, this, this cannot work because you're too big. You know, if you're the size of Togo, uh, it's okay to have central government controlling everything, or Benin, or something like that. Uh, even country, uh, well, look at the Congo, it's the same thing. Uh, the central government trying to exercise control all over. So I think Nigeria has a good system, South Africa has a good system, because there's maximum decentralization. You have, Nigeria has 34 states. So Aromia has been given uh, has not been recognized as a, an entity that deserves self-determination. All peoples deserve self-determination and the Oromos have yet to have it. Even though my good friend, uh, late, the late good friend, Tess Fidinka, I think he was the last president of Ethiopia before the end of the Eritrean war. And he was an Oromo, <laughs> but, uh, Basically, the Oromo people need self-determination. That's the answer. Thank you very much indeed. Um, th there will be lots and lots of questions asked later, but first, we'd like to hear from William Davidson, the founder and editor of Ethiopia Insight, and um, the senior political analyst for Ethiopia on the International Crisis Group, or senior analyst, rather on the International Crisis Group. William, I'd be very interested to hear your take on, on the question and on uh, Ambassador Cohen's uh, presentation. Sure, thanks, um, thanks Trevor, and um, good afternoon everyone from, from Addis Ababa. Um, <clears throat> and I think I should you know, say first, the real heartfelt um, thanks for the invitation to speak at this event. Um, <clears throat> you know, honoured honored to do so. Um, and then, you know, obviously I, I, I'm fully aware of Awal Kasim Allo's uh, campaign against me and efforts to, to disinvite me. Um, so obviously I appreciate um, that that's caused a certain amount of disturbance, um, but you know, it didn't result in any disinvitation and I appreciate that also. Um, obviously I do not want to, to dwell on those matters unduly because obviously there's far more important things to discuss. Um, yeah, I mean, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll just say a few brief words, really, really, Trevor. I think there'll be lots of questions and it's always better to have an exchange rather than a one-way uh, presentation. Um, I think, you know, uh, you know, to sort of state the obvious, um, the situation that we're seeing now um, in Oromia, um, as in a you know, great deal of political discontent, um, yeah, human rights violations, you know, regular instability, a lack of a distinct lack of support um, for Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed and, and the ruling party, uh, as we understand it. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I think it's, uh, this stems from a failure to translate the key demands. And I'm looking at with a much narrower perspective than uh, Ambassador Cohen. But you know, the failure to translate the key demands um, of the Oromo protest movement that was so integral um, to political change in Ethiopia, that seems to lie at the somewhere very near the core of the current discontent 
Um, and I generally, and I'd love, love to hear from others on this, I generally articulate those demands as, yes, you know, self-determination, um, sure, um, but also the specific elements of the, of the demands. Um, so we have the, the language demand for Afan Oromo to have the same status as Amharic uh, as a federal working language um, at the least. Um, and then there are the demands on, uh, with regards to Addis Ababa or Fin Finney. Um, and I think that raises an interesting point because, you know, whilst there's an understanding um, that Oromia and Oromos uh, deserve to have a greater, um, a greater say um, and maybe greater benefits from Fin Finney, these aren't always particularly well articulated. Um, and I think, you know, I'll, I'll bring this point back in later, but I think more could be done um, to, to articulate those demands, essentially. Um, I think the other broad area that I see is sort of integral is this, yes, this issue of, yes, self-determination, but also sort of genuine autonomy um, or, you know, a fair or a fairer deal for Oromia um, from, from the federal system, um, from the, the political economy that predominates in Ethiopia. And this is, of course, not unrelated to the Fin Finney issue. Um, so we're looking at issues like fiscal federalism, um, massively topical right now, given Tigray's situation. But, you know, we know that a lot of companies, they do a lot of business in Oromia. Um, they've been given a lot of land and a lot of uh, basic resources on the cheap, uh, including, of course, uh, labor from Oromos, and then a lot of the revenues collecting at the center. You know, these are fundamentals to the functioning uh, and the equity of a federal system. And very little has been done, to my understanding, with regards to these types of demands, despite um, <clears throat> the advent um, of a prime minister who came from the Oromo bloc of the, um, of the, um, of the ruling coalition as it was. I've probably already gone on um, a bit longer than um, than I wanted to, so I'll try and run through the points quickly. And this is a, an overview of Ethiopia's political situation um, and, and where the Oromo situation plays into that. Um, I think as, um, you know, given, given that political uh, situation, you know, the frustrated demands, uh, the discontent with the government, um, there does seem to be a prevailing problem of um, significant fragmentation across the Oromo political spectrum. So we can go from the center with the prime minister um, and those uh, ruling party figures around him. And then I think we can move out from that center to the more Oromo nationalist elements still within the ruling establishment. And then we move across the spectrum to the more moderate ends of the uh, Oromo Federalist Congress, let's say, um, and then further out into the Oromo Liberation Front and, and then to the sort of Oromo Liberation Army and their supporters. Um, and somewhere within that is this street, street, street movement and the Oromo youth, and obviously the various sort of different elements of the so-called Kero, um, which, you know, the way it's presented in the media particularly is generally more distorted than informative, I think. But fair to say that there is a large Oromo uh, politicized constituency, which, uh, which various uh, elements of the Oromo political elite or the organized Oromo political factions are vying for the hearts and minds of. Um, but what I'm really trying to say is that, you know, given this very difficult political situation we find ourselves in, um, those, you know, to close those divisions and present a more united front from, you know, some form of sort of nominal Oromo nationalist bloc um, would seem to be a useful thing to do at this stage. That would mean Yes, you know, it's achieving some sort of consensus of purpose between the parties, the factions, but also articulating these specific demands um, as specifically as possible so they could be presented as a, as a united program. I'm not ignoring the very difficult condition Ethiopia is in. Um, I don't see the prospect of an election next year as at all inspiring for Ethiopia's democratic advancement. So I think the first order of business is to work out how the, or, the, the, you know, the formal Oromo political opposition plans to compete um, if they plan to compete at all in those elections. Because given the way things are going, um, I expect these elections to have a similar level of political repression 
um, as former, uh, as elections under the EPRDF era, particularly the last two in 2010, 2015. Um, I think that's about all I wanted to say, just on this, perhaps just to, you know, to elaborate on this issue of the uh, United Front and articulating demands in a coherent fashion. Um, given the situation we have in Ethiopia, I am sort of certainly willing to sign on to all of the political uh, players in Ethiopia who think that now is the time for some sort of fundamental discussion of Ethiopia's main political fault lines in the form of a national dialogue. That would be a formal structured process um, that aims to really address the causes, the root causes of Ethiopia's political dysfunction. So again, you know, to present a united front, as united front as possible, um, would definitely be advantageous um, in, that, in that scenario. Um, and then I think, you know, also as well as addressing historic grievances, we want to present um, a forward-looking uh, program as well. Uh, the best idea I have, uh, or I have had, or the best ideas I've heard um, over the, the years since these, you know, political rifts have, have widened and the political situation has got more serious, um, and this is kind of in line with what Ambassador Cohen was saying, but was, you know, how can we democratize this federation? Um, how can we improve the functioning of the federation? Are the rough edges to the constitutional order that can be smoothed off without undermining ethno-regional autonomy and self-determination in a way which is going to further destabilize Ethiopia. This process of democratizing the Federation and improving the constitutional order seems to be the natural way and the natural type of program that, that the Oromo opposition um, would get behind. And again, I think it's a process of achieving maximal consensus on these issues and really articulating what that program looks like. Um, I will just finish very quickly. Um, I've been focused more on the Tigray situation recently. Um, and I really do think that we're close to moving into a new dangerous phase um, of the crisis in Ethiopia because of the very real prospect of serious conflict between Tigray and the federal government. Um, I think that makes all of these conversations uh, even more urgent than they were anyway. That doesn't say anything about Oromia's internal situation, but it does mean that Oromia um, could, soon could soon find itself in an even more turbulent um, federation than exists now. Okay, thank you again for inviting me and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, William. That was very interesting and very informative. Um, we won't question you now. We will give the floor to Professor Asfal Bayene. Um, Professor Asfal, although his um, expertise on paper is in um, mechanical engineering, especially sustainable and renewable energy, um, for which he has won awards, by the way, he has been a board member of the Aromo Studies Association on and off for 20 plus years, and in fact was the president of the Aromo Studies Association from 2005 to 2006. He was a board member during the time when the Aromo Studies Association had its one and only conference in Finfine, and that was in uh, 2018. So, Asfal, welcome to the floor. Yabab, sir, you don't go on for too long. Um, and then we have lots of time for questions uh, afterwards. Thank you very much. Thank you, Trev. It's an honor. And uh, in, in addition to the few notes I have prepared for myself. Uh, oh no. A few notes that I wanted to touch. So it will be a challenge to finish within five minutes, but I'll try. Uh, one note, uh, especially with um, what William mentioned um, as detailed solutions, I really think it is too late for the central government to be trusted uh, with any solution. And I'll be more than happy to come to that. Uh, the, there is no confidence uh, to, to lead any change as far as uh, most of the people in Ethiopia are concerned, especially the uh, Oromos. Uh, the causes of the current crisis, I will take, uh, number one is the weak power, uh, a self-legitimized uh, criteria has expired. And uh, it is not only weak, but it is also 
legitimate in the eyes of most of the opposition. Uh, and this is, uh, and that's point number two, exacerbated by media. I have a lot, most humbly and politely, uh, to say a few words to, uh, including William, of course, and other representatives here too, uh, la later on. And uh, the main reason why I think the central government is very weak uh, also uh, with any solutions it poses. Just on the executive side, 4,000 police officers left their post about two weeks ago. 4,000 police left, and this is a reliable information, names of which we have. 4,000 policemen in a very poor country leaving their income. And the assumption uh, is that they joined the Oromo Liberation Army, even if they didn't. Uh, it is a mistrust on the government. 75 army fighters in one single instance joined also the Oromo Liberation Army. Uh, the senior officer, the colonel has been interviewed. Ogaden, Walaita, Benishangul, Sidama, Oromia, even the Amara region, are in turmoil. Uh, where does the confidence come from? Tigray, as uh, William mentioned, is becoming a government inside a government. Now, on the judiciary side, uh, what I mentioned is just the executive. On the judiciary side, remember, the court ordered 24 of 11 members to be released after the police and the attorney general couldn't come with any case against them court order to release them was simply hijacked. The police wouldn't listen to the court. Where is the judiciary? And where does the confidence come? The federal government will do anything. And now what is happening is we don't even know who ordered the arrest of 23 of the 24 were released. And activists who write from diaspora, by our own colleagues, they just write, they are not fighting, are accused in absentia. now become so random and, and frequent in Ethiopia. Uh, Mr. Uh, Demeke told the Amharas to be armed, to be armed. Mind you, the Oromos, in Oromia it is illegal to carry a knife, a knife that you need, by the, by the way, to cut uh, bushes and, and plant uh, some stuff. The farmers routinely use it. It's illegal to carry even a knife. The prime minister urges his region to be armed. Where is the rule of law? Even the patriarch, the head of the Orthodox Church says, we have to defend ourselves. And Oromia is being disarmed. On the legislative side, um, well, Amnesty International have covered it in its June report. And just to read one line, arbitrarily detained more than 10,000 people, summarily evicted whole families from their homes, some of which were burned and destroyed, and in some cases were complicit intercommunal targeting minorities. That is on the government side. The media discrepancy, we will go into it later, or I don't want to get too far, but let me give you one example, little example. A young lady was chanting in one of the large gatherings, calling for the Oromos to marry an Oromo to preserve age and culture. It was funny, and a lot of people, people, seniors took it, uh, but this was criminal media, and the police went after her. She went into hiding. It was a crime. It was made a crime to say, okay. But months later, a group of Nen or Ababa, Finfinne, or almost get out of Addis Ababa. Nobody went after them. The media discrepancy is deafening, including the international media where we had the right to expect some neutral teaching Oromo language in, in Addis. Objection to teach Gada, which is, by the way, three years after UNESCO's uh, decision to call it an intelligible cultural heritage, now there is a serious anti-Gada movement. 
criminalizing the entire historic system. Facebook blocks routinely Oromo activists and mostly or only Oromo activists. And the media is uh, doing a disservice to Ethiopia. And what should be done? I can go on and on, but what should be done? Uh, I think um, for the Oromos, we know we need our own power. Only a powerful, organized Oromo can defend the interests of Oromos. But this is, you know, in the, in the, in the world of the diplomats, you cannot say that. Power. Now, to be convinced, I can also say transitional government is the only solution because the existing government is not trusted, cannot be trusted. How to, especially with due respect, Ambassador, the previous two transitional governments, including the one you, you helped establish, in my humble opinion, were miserable failures. So what we need now is a new government that is bottom up participating all opposition parties and force, forces. Um, otherwise, in about 205 years ago, uh, John Adams wrote to Thomas Jefferson. And he wrote, the revolution was in the minds of the people. And this was affected in the course of 15 years before a drop of blood was drawn at Lexington. This is 200 years about the American Revolution. I think the revolution in the minds of Oromos is now affected. There is no need for any more blood, but this must be accepted. And what the uh, earlier ambassador mentioned, uh, self-determination is, as far as the Oromos are concerned, a done deal, nothing less. Thank you. I went maybe a little over, Trev. Thank you very much, Astra. You're fine, that's great. Now, um, I'm sure other people are bursting to ask questions. I would like to give um, Ambassador Curran to, to respond to Asfau's claim that the transitional government of 91 to 92 okay. was a miserable mm -hmm. failure. I think uh, perhaps Ambassador Curran would like to respond to that. Right. And then I would ask uh, a question of uh, William, and then I think we'll open it to the floor. But um, I the uh, opportunity to uh, opportunity. It's also for you who are speaking. I've unmuted. I've muted Birata Feyes. Sorry. Ambassador Cohen, would you like to respond to Asfal's uh, um, comment, please? Well, uh, calling it a miserable failure, I think, is an exaggeration. <clears throat> but the problem is that <clears throat> every government that has been in power in Addis has succumbed to what I would call the Menelik syndrome. We are in power and at us, therefore we control everything. And, and everyone has to obey us. I remember I had long conversations with, uh, with Mel Zanawi after he became uh, prime minister. And I, I remember one subject was land reform. I said, why, why does the state own all the land? Why don't you allow uh, the farmers to own the land so they can borrow money and improve the land and, 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 and buy machinery and that sort of thing. He said, if we do that, then Amhara will come in and buy all the land from these peasants who will spend the money in two years and then become serfs in their own land. So there is an ethnic, there's an ethnic prejudice around. And I think that Everybody who is in power in uh, Addis, whether it's the emperor or the derg or, or the TPLF, they they develop this Menelik syndrome. Was 
in order to be safe for our own security, we have to control everything. And, and that is the great, the great tragedy of Ethiopia, in my view. I wholeheartedly agree in terms of the zero sum politics has been the bane of that country for the last two, 300 years. Um, thank you very much for that comment. Uh, William, um, can I ask you to address the Yeah, merci. Can I ask you to address halt, the question? Halt, halt, halt. Amelti, halt. Yeah, okay. Are they a state of no, I've, I've uh, just uh, done that. Um, William, uh, how do you respond to claims that the media, including the, the media for which you uh, have some responsibility, have been biased against the Oromo cause in terms of their coverage uh, of the last couple of years? And how would you respond to those criticisms? And then after that, we'll open the thing to general discussion. Is that okay, William? Yeah, of course, yeah, no problem. Thanks. Yeah, first, so first of all, I have full responsibility for everything published on Ethiopia Insight. I'm the founder, um, the, ma the manager, and, and the editor. Um, I mean, I think, um, I think in general, um, one of the major problems um, with the Ethiopian political media scene um, is a lack of reliable coverage. Uh, you mentioned in your sort of introductory comments, Trevor, about the lack of reporting um, on the situation, you know, primarily in also probably maybe the Guji zones to some extent. And these are absolutely legitimate points you're making. Um, you know, I think you and me discussed the ins and outs of this recently. I'm not, you know, saying that I agree with, you know, all of your um, analysis and, and conclusions, but, you know, to state that there are atrocities being committed um, in these areas which are not being adequately reported um, is absolutely correct to my understanding. And I think we should keep sight of just how important this is. Um, if we go back to the um, the recent terrible, um, you know, the, the, the protests and the, the, the terrible incident of Hachalu's killing and then the violent aftermath, we all know that there is a massive um, battle for the narrative um, with regards to, to this event. Um, I'm aware um, that people on this, this call uh, consider this to be an entirely government PP concocted conspiracy where paid agents um, were brought in to destabilize, um, act as mercenaries um, to paint the kettle um, in, a, in a negative light. Um, and this was obviously done to legitimize a crackdown on the Oromo nationalist opposition elite. Clearly on the other side of the divide, um, and this is where the you know, polarization has a meaning, an important real life meaning in Ethiopian politics. The other side, it's claims of ethnic cleansing, it's claims of genocide um, um, directed against um, Oromo elements, most commonly, the, again, the, the Kedo. Um, now, why are we in a situation where two such polarized narratives are thriving amongst their own audiences. This is because of the lack of reliable information that is coming out of Oromia. Despite you know, the size and the, and the, um, the, the development of uh, even some of these large cities in Oromia, uh, there is no independent media to speak of. There is no private media to speak of. There are not even, you know, bloggers who are dedicated um, to, to, you know, to, uh, to factual reporting. Um, of course, I'm not denying the networks that you rely on um, and, the, and the media that you rely on that uh, all exist. But I do think it would be another thing um, to have established um, media operating, local media operating in these 
towns and cities and also rural locations. Um, and this type of analysis, analysis can also, also be extended to civil society as well. Yes, there are plenty of groups doing excellent work trying to uncover what's going on, but there's not met that many of them. Certainly not ones that are well organized and well institutionalized that are operating from the ground. Um, I think it's looking at these deficiencies which feed in to Ethiopia's political problems is the most kind of promising area of inquiry here. Allegations of bias are, of course, um, by and large, you know, most of the time they're subjective. We can all make allegations of bias. The problem is that everyone has their own idea of what bias is. I'm not necessarily denying um, that there is an imbalance in the media coverage, that opponents of the Oromo nationalist cause hold considerable media power, um, and they have particular influence, maybe amongst the you know, some diaspora communities and some urban communities in Ethiopia. That's all true and fair. Um, but if we're actually going to get um, you know, away from this sort of battle of the narratives, let's say, and really shine a light on what's going on um, in, in Oromia and therefore have a more representative picture emerge. Uh, I think that would be down, you know, I think what, what, one way we could do that is by focusing on strengthening the very, very weak capacity and reach um, of Ethiopian media and, and civil society. That's very uh, insightful. Thank you very much, William. Um, I think now we can open up to, uh, to general questions. I'm just going to scan the screen to see who has hands raised. To... Ah, Mohammed, there is a button you can press to say your hands raised. So, but we'll, I'll come back to you. So to... Okay. So to begin with, uh, Mohammed Hassan, would you like to make your point? Thank you. And welcome, by the way. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Trevor. Um, uh, uh, my questions, a few questions are directed to uh, William Davidson. Uh, oh. Uh, he mentioned about uh, companies getting land around uh, Finfinne. There was, uh, uh, from my understanding, there was uh, n not so much land confiscation as it is currently under Abiyis regime, even during the time of master plan. There is a massive uh, uh, removal of population, Oromo population, from around Finfinne. Um, I'll come to the question in a second. He also mentioned about Oromo nationalists within the federal government. Please name one Oromo nationalist who is within the federal government. They are in prison. Former OPDO officials who have Oromo sympathy have been removed from there, fired. Some of them detained. I can provide you with the names if you want to. And my question for you is, strictly speaking, is there really any federal government in Ethiopia? Is it not one man's rule? Who appointed the president of Oromia, the president of the regional state of Somalia, the president of Afar region, almost everywhere. It, it's, I am not sure. And is there a single, the government does not allow, uh, definitely the Oromos are, uh, in terms of media, we are far behind, no doubt about that aspect. But the government closed uh, uh, the, the only uh, 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 pro Oromo media that really uh, uh, presents issues that even uh, uh, described the situation about Corona, about, about Corona in 17 different languages. And that media was closed down 
in uh, 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 Ethiopia and uh, basically it is the government that wants to deprive the Oromo from having any voice in the affairs of their own country. And finally, let me, uh, as, as a final point, uh, let me say, I, I would really like to know uh, what is the root cause of conflict between our uh, scholar, a fine scholar, someone I have known for a long time, uh, and, uh, and yourself. Uh, and, I hope this issue will really be resolved in a very civilized way so that you will be as uh, sympathetic uh, to the cause of our people, people who are killed daily. I have never, I have studied Ethiopian history. I have never uh, known a time when a three year old child is killed. A 70-year-old woman is burned in the house. An eight-year girl is raped. Uh, uh, and it is really, uh, 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 please respond to the questions I have raised. Over to you, William. Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks very much for those. Um, I, I, so I presume that the kind of land issue was just kind of prefacing the, the general, um, the generally expressed concerns that things are getting worse now. Is that correct? Yes. <clears throat> All right. Yeah. So, um, yeah, no, good, 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 good questions. Thanks. Thanks for those. I think, um, you know, um, you know, I, I guess I, you know, just brief, brief initial remarks. And I was just trying to understand, trying to explain, you know, what I saw as the core, um, you know, the core reasons that's led to the kind of current predicament that we're in and then trying to look at kind of constructive ways forward. I wasn't so much commenting on the state of repression now. Um, you know, I think Trevor did that adequately. Um, I did refer to it, but it was just a short introductory presentation focusing on those issues. I, I would like to throw, uh, and I hope this doesn't seem as, as too evasive, I'd like to throw the issue of whether there are Oromo nationalists within the federal government back at you um, and the other people on this call. Um, I mean, you know, clearly there are people within the federal government who claim to espouse a form of Oromo nationalism. Um, people who are former members of the OLF. I mean, let's just take, let's, let, let's take, um, let's take Lencho Bati, for example. Um, speak, to, speak to me about Lencho Bati, because as I understand it, this guy, this is somebody who has pursued his version, um, his articulation of Oromo nationalist causes for quite a while, and he's definitely within within the federal government. Um, so this seems to me, um, yes, obviously I get your point. Uh, I'm certainly not denying that key Oromo nationalist opposition leaders have been recently jailed, whether that's from the OFC uh, or whether that's from the OLF, um, and also a, a huge number at, at lower ranks as well. We have 4,000 people being prosecuted right now for, for crimes associated um, you know, with the violence in July. So yes, a huge move against the Oromo nationalist opposition. Um, but that isn't necessarily to say that there aren't people within the federal government who consider themselves to be Oromo nationalist. This issue that you raise about sort of genuine federalism, um, I think there is um, entirely legitimate concerns raised there. And I think they revolve around the structure and the nature of Prosperity Party, obviously. Um, we know the Prosperity Party has a unitary character to it. Um, we know that the presidents of the two most powerful regions were formerly the prime minister's chief of staff and national security advisor. Um, you know, I largely concur um, with your um, description of the extent of central control, de facto central control. And that is centered within the prime minister's office over those regional governments. Um, I, think that, I think those are entirely legitimate points. And you know, given, and I think this has to be presented in the broader political conundrum that we have, you know, given there are powerful political forces, um, such as the TPLF, uh, such as the Oromo Nationalist Opposition, um, who are pushing for the type of enhanced decentralization that Ambassador Cohen was describing. Well, you know, considering that PP, um, and not just the PP members, but also the Ethiopian and Pan-Ethiopian um, opposition who kind of basically are supporting PP, Consider they are pushing in the other direction. 
in terms of wanting to increase the power of the federal government, uh, reduce uh, the autonomy of regional states, um, and probably ultimately do something about the ethno-regional character, um, so the ethno-linguistic nature of those regions. You know, this really is at the heart of Ethiopia's predicament. So I agree with you that the PP's nature um, and, and, the, and the Prime Minister's um, extensive control over that party is preventing um, the, the, the practice of, of genuine federalism. And that is also coming on top of these very divergent views about where the Federation needs to go next. Um, yeah, I, you know, I, I, I'm obviously fully aware of, of the closure of, um, of media who are focused um, on reporting <clears throat> on Oromir affairs and also broader issues like COVID, as you described. Um, I mean, yeah, you know, su su suffice to say, I think that whilst, um, you know, an, an entity like Oromir Media Network um, was doing some excellent reporting, to my understand, um, it certainly wasn't making a breakthrough um, in terms of, you know, having a media organization which was transcending Ethiopia's political divisions and really, therefore, able to improve the kind of character um, or the quality of the public debate. I, I, I'm not in any way um, that you're downplaying, disparaging the work that Oromia Media, Media Network did, but I'm really talking about something quite different when I talk about, you know, how different would the political situation be if there was a network um, of um, you know, locally based media organizations and also you know, civil society who were reporting actively from all of these different localities around Oromia where events are, uh, you know, in the, in, the, in the broader political debate are so um, contentious. And I really don't think that we should spend too much time um, on this dispute that we have with Awal. Um, and I don't want to sound um, like I'm not taking responsibility here, but, you know, yes, uh, I published an article um, about Awal, uh, a commentary. It was highly critical of him and some of his activism. Um, that represented views uh, widely shared amongst many Ethiopians. Um, there were certainly elements in that commentary which I look back and think I would have edited differently. But that goes for every single article I've ever written or edited. There are always imperfections. Um, the campaign that Awal has mounted since is wildly disproportionate and it's also fantastically misguided considering the type of platform that my website, Ethiopia Insight, has provided for Oromo nationalist perspectives. I understand the respect that you and others have for Awol, but we have to be honest here. The nature of his allegations against me are, you seem utterly disingenuous. And it's also, I do not understand the strategy in terms of attacking someone as a publisher and as an analyst who does a reasonable job, I think, of representing and presenting Yoromo nationalist perspective. Because how is that in Ethiopia's broader interests? And how is that in Awal's interests? Because we've published so much material that aligned with his views. So I really have to question whether this campaign is in the interest of Ethiopia, in the interest of constructive public discourse, and whether it's in the interest of the Oromo people. It seems to me to be emanating um, you know, from some you know, particular um, personal affront um, that, um, that Awal felt. Um, so I hope that, you know, is the beginning of an answer to the question. But like I said, I really don't think this forum should spend too much time on these matters. I agree absolutely, William. Um, we should continue to address the possibility of media bias, however. But uh, I, now I believe um, the next person to raise their hand was Abraham Mosissa. And uh, once, Abraham, would you like to uh, ask your question now, please? Un unmute. Can you hear me now? Yes, thanks, Abraham. Yeah, uh, regarding uh, uh, Davidson, I just have a very short comment. Uh, I think William Davidson should not be a, a topic of uh, controversy or uh, a topic of debate because he is a reporter. What we expect from a reporter 
is to be objective and present uh, uh, what's happening in that country and not engage in any conflict with uh, Romo intellectuals or others. Uh, regarding his reporting, uh, if you are listening to me, William, I like your reporting on what you know. I think you are very good at what you know. Your problem, from what I know, from what I see is what you don't know. Uh, what you don't know is uh, you spend too much time uh, in Fimfinne, uh, what you call Addis and Magale, and usually you present the views of these two who happen to be Amarat and Tigre as if this is a representative of uh, the objective situation in Ethiopia. So I think you have to widen your uh, uh, source of information. Uh, don't stay uh, only with few elites. I understand it's very culturally interesting uh, to go and have a beer with them, but that's not going to be uh, the objective situation. For example, how much time do you spend with, just an example, Dawid Ipsa, who happened to be the, uh, the OLF leader? How many times did you interview him? Vis-a-vis uh, -vis other, other groups. If you don't interview him, you know the, uh, a person who is representing the Roma Liberation Front, who is uh, representing the Roma people, then you don't have a story to be honest with you. Even today, you're telling me what really concerns you is uh, what's happening in Tigray. That's ignorance. You see, yes, Tigray is, uh, Tigray is armed, yes, Tigray is organized, but Tigray is only 6% of the Ethiopian population. 40 million, 50 million people is uh, entire Oromia is in, on fire. You're sleeping in Addis. You're supposed to be very objective and uh, interview very important people as opposed to condemning and uh, writing sarcastic things about uh, our who, by the way, is so objective, in fact, he is not presenting the view of Oromo nationalists in full. But from your perspective, this guy is too radical for you. It just means you, there is so much you don't know that you don't know that's your problem. Uh, that's what I'm going to say about uh, David. But uh, is the ambassador Cohen still around? If he's still around, if you are listening to me, um, just a very simple question. Ambassador Cohen, uh, how much, uh, this is actually the same problem uh, that I see in the State Department uh, uh, with ambassadors. They don't listen to or pay attention to locals, natives, intellectuals. They don't invite them to their office and say, okay, what's really happening in your country, in your community, they never do that. In this, for example, back in the 1990s, uh, there was a conference called by the uh, John Hopkins Advanced School of International Studies. And the keynote speaker was uh, uh, Susan Rice. And you happen to be there with two of your friends, Ambassador Bath and uh, your partner uh, Woods at that point, you had a business. And I happened to be sitting next to you. During the break, I talked to uh, Ambassador Bass and told him, I think the US made one of the biggest mistake to recognize TPLF as a legitimate government when the TPLF and the EPLF killed all incumbent OLF leaders, or OLF fighters, chased them, uh, the rest out of the country, controlled Oromia, and you as a representative, I, 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 didn't, I didn't directly talk to you, but I was talking to Ambassador um, Bass, you were quiet and you endorsed it silently. And I told Ambassador um, Bass, this is going to be the biggest mistake of your decision. And that country is going to be in a chaos because of this decision for decades to come. Ambassador Bass looked me in the eye and said, Abraham, Ethiopia is in good hands now with arrogance. 
why don't you guys pay attention to people who know the country so well, educated, and can explain, rather be so arrogant? Is that because you make policies that's going to serve the U.S. interest outside the interest of those, uh, those natives? Is that, is that why you do that? Thank you. Thank you very much, Abraham. Um, first of all, uh, Ambassador Cohen, would you like to respond? And then we'll give uh, William Davison a chance to respond. And yeah, then yeah. <coughs> well, I, I over the handling of the questions. Over to you, Ambassador Cohen. Uh, thank you. Uh, first of all, I'd like to tell you that State Department diplomats all over the world spend a lot of time talking to people in their own language and not just to government. Uh, when I was uh, ambassador to Senegal, I spent a lot of time outside of the capital city and I borrowed airplanes from the United States Air Force to go into the furthest reaches of, of Senegal and all US diplomats do that. So I think it's wrong to say we don't talk to the people. Okay, so why, you're saying we made a mistake in recognizing the uh, TPLF government. Well, they won the war. You know, we don't look at people and say, oh, they're bad guys, so we're not gonna recognize them. They won the war, they were in control in Addis, and they, uh, in effect, control the country, they control the military. I remember going to, this was in, uh, I remember in July 1991, I believe, uh, the TPLF government called a conference, an all Ethiopian conference to plan the future. And they decided to have a democracy and all various groups were there. And for the first time in my career, when I, I was invited there as assistant secretary of state, and for the first time in my career, I had to have personal security. The State Department had an armored car for me and people with guns surrounding me. And why was that? Because I was blamed for the loss of Eritrea and the people were very angry. So we don't look at the, unless it's very, very bad, we don't look at the nature of a regime that's in power and say, we don't like you because you, you're bad people or we don't like your policies. If you're in control, we recognize it as the government and we start working with you. Doesn't mean we agree with you or that we approve of you, but we don't have a policy of good guys and bad guys. And uh, of course, when we disagree, we could be not nice to governments, but we don't depend our recognition of who is in power on the basis of morality or how good that people are. Thank you. Can I just say uh, a word on that? Abraham, I, I think we need to continue. I'm sorry. Okay. I, we've, uh, I made a mistake in terms of allocating questions. People had been assigned to uh, prepare questions beforehand, and I was meant to refer to those questions before going to the open audience. I do apologize for that. That is entirely my fault. But Sura Banti, I believe, has uh, a stock of questions that she wants to um, refer to, and can I hand over to you, Sura? Yes, you can. So, uh, thank you, Dr. Trevor. We have received um, a couple of questions from the broader viewers, and we would like to just read to the panelists the questions, and then I would uh, ask you to answer. So, uh, Abu Jamal from the U.S., Adelensa from Australia, and Abu Zalalim will be assisting me reading the questions to you. So, uh, Aposalalem, would you read out the first question? Sure. So, uh, thank you. Can you all hear me clearly? Yeah. Okay, great. So, this question goes to Ambassador Khan. Um, it goes like this. You are widely believed to be the main architect to bring uh, TPLF slash EPRDF to power 1991, which led to the transitional charter. Among the political forces who you seem to have excluded from the London, the London process back then, the OLF is still on the margins of Ethiopia's power center. Yet, excluding OLF from the power sharing agreement in 1991 and in 2018 did not bring about stability and 
OLF seems to have remained more or less a natural choice for the Oromo people to be represented by the country's uh, power play. Also, marginalizing OLF has become conceptually congruent with marginalizing the Oromo people. The single majority out of the more than 82 constituencies of multi-ethnic polity known as Ethiopia. So the questions to you, uh, uh, Ambassador Cohen are, do you still think that keeping OLF out of the 1991 negotiations was the right thing to do? Do you have any regrets about that? If in case you do have, you, be, you believe uh, you made a mistake, then what have you done to correct your mistakes? And would you be willing to use your diplomatic experience and your political leverage to change the current state of things whereby the OLF and the Oromo people are systematically marginalized and mass, arrest, mass arrested and persecuted? Thank you. Uh, well, thank you for that question. Uh, the OLF was not excluded from our discussions uh, at the end of the war in 1990. They were present. The OLF had a people at the London conference. They were, they could talk all the time. They could argue and what have you. Uh, unfortunately, they were very quiet. And uh, the TPLF was in control of Addis. Uh, we asked them to go into Addis because the, because Mengistu had fled and it was very, it was very unstable. The, uh, the Derg army had retreated to Addis and there, there was no one controlling them. And we were afraid that there would be all sorts of problems. So we asked the TPLF who were very close to Addis to go in there and take control and they did. And there was no pillaging, there was no killing of anyone there. But I do regret the fact that the OLF was not more energetic at our conference to exert itself to say, we want this and we want that. But I, I also regret that I did not bring them in, did not encourage them. So it was only at the last minute they said, we want a referendum on possible Oromo self-determination or, or Oromo independence. And I was quite frustrated because this, we had spent a whole week in London and I said, look, we gotta end this. We have to end this war with Eritrea. So I, I, I agree with you, I dismissed the OLF. I said, it's too late. And I, I am sorry now that I did that. I don't know if it would have made a big difference because the TPLF controlled Addis. And that, that is a key point. But I would agree with you that I did not pay enough attention to the OLF and therefore to the aspirations of the Oromo people. And I apologize for that. <laughs> All right, thank you for your answer, Mr. Cohen. The next question goes to William Davidson and Adelensa, I will ask you to read it. <coughs> Adelensa, are you there? Okay, um, thank you very much, Sarah. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Yes, we hear you. Yeah, yeah, go ahead, yeah, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Sura, and thank you. Uh, Mr. William, question for you was, um, what is your account of Ari Ahmed's uh, flagrant violation of um, an opposition party or organizations that, um, organizations autonomy by intervening the internal matters of the organization? Um, the case in this point here is that the ruling party double standard on the agenda of dismantling the OLF is very clear. And when the government sponsored the splinter group within the OLF was given protection by state security forces, while the same security uh, structure put the OLF chairman under siege, uh, forcefully closing the organization's headquarter offices and most of the OLF's leaders languishing in the uh, concentration camps like prisons, even at un undisclosed locations. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Ensa. Thanks for the question. Um, yes, yeah, so <clears throat> it, it it seems apparent that in many ways um, the you know the political repression that we're seeing um, 
you know, particularly of the formal parties, which is the, the you know the, the subject matter here. It, it looks very similar to you know what to what we saw um, in the sort of uh, EPIDF era. Let's say you know if you recall in my introductory remarks, I said that you know this upcoming election sadly looks like something which is going to resemble you know to some extent. Uh, the 2010 and 2015 elections more than any kind of transformative democratic exercise, which of course many of us were hopeful for um, when the changes occurred in 2018. And this kind of like interventions in the internal affairs of parties is obviously characteristic of the way the EPRDF dealt with the opposition um, in the past. I'm not going to pretend, um, and this will be am ammunition um, for the for the critic, um, uh, the, the previous speaker, I, I'm not going to pretend that I know the ins and outs of exactly what's been going on inside the OLF leadership recently. Um, I've been watching it from afar. I've seen the allegations. Um, you know, I'm aware. Um, I'm aware that uh, it, it's obvious what it looks like, um, but I, I'm not privy to any extra information there. What I will say um, is that there is, you know, clearly there is uh, evidence that we're seeing the repeat of those types of tactics of co-option, uh, promoting splinter groups uh, to try and disrupt opposition activities. But more importantly, this is coming back on, um, again, further EPRDF style tactics that we saw in the pre-COVID months when the election campaign was winding up in Ethiopia um, and, the, and the opposition, particularly in Oromia, especially the RFC after Jawa's uh, joining the party, was engaging in some pretty dynamic political activity. And it was then we saw, you know, permissions denied for, for rallies, um, permissions denied for meeting halls, offices closed down left, right and centre, uh, recently opened offices, the arrest um, of uh, political activists and leaders. And this was all in the pre-COVID days. Um, obviously, since COVID has come in, we've had this ultimately uh, pretty disastrous election delay and, and highly contentious extension of the government's terms, and then the arrest um, of huge swathes of the Oromo nationalist leadership, as well as other political leads, leaders and lower level activists. So yes, absolutely, I'm aware of the allegations that go against the OLF. I could see exactly what it looks like. Um, but it, to me, it is part of a broader trend um, of renewed political repression, um, which again creates huge problems in terms of the credibility of the upcoming electoral process. And I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't know if anyone wants me to respond to um, uh, the, the previous, um, the previous m m remarks from Abraham. I I'm happy to do so, but again, I really think that people have got more important things to talk about uh, than which section of the Ethiopian political elite I've been having drinks with in, in Addis or, or Finfinny. All right, uh, our next question goes to Professors Fobayene and Jamal. Can you, Hobo Jamal, can you read it? Hobo Jamal, are you there? Okay, Thanks. then, yeah. Jamal does seem to be inside here. Okay, then I will just read it out. For so, inside, a few minutes ago. Okay, I will just read the question out. Uh, so, this goes to Professor Asfal Bayena. Given the history of total absence of free elections and the history of. Okay. Given the history of total absence of free elections in the history of Ethiopia, what are the reasons to be optimistic that any upcoming elections will be free and fair? What, op what options do the Oromo people and other oppressed nations and nationalities and people in Ethiopia are left with at, at this particular moment? And do you think the idea of forgiving a transitional, a transitional government the right uh, a way forward if so, should it be a part of that? Thank you, Sura. Uh, I'm not on mute. Um, if I may, I was hoping to get a second to add to the previous comment uh, where um, I think William addressed most of it. 
to Muhammad uh, that uh, you are going to calm the things down. And, and I'm, I'm very happy to read that. But I wanted to also make a few statements where, uh, by way of just giving you an input um, as one of the Oromo uh, voices, um, to also, I think you cannot undermine what uh, somebody said earlier to diversify your sources. I'll give you one very simple example. In, uh, in July, you wrote about tensions between the Amhara and Oromo have been aggravated by June 22 by the assassination uh, and events leading to, to them. And this is uh, in reference to Asamino, uh, Asamino's murder. Asamino fueled Amhara Oromo friction by using provocative re rhetoric, etc. I didn't have a clue about the, that guy until you wrote this. Uh, we don't know. I mean, Oromos don't know him. He is not a reason for the Amhara Oromo uh, fuel. Uh, and um, he may have a conflict with the prime minister, but he is not in the picture of the Oromos. I can guarantee you that. And, and that is probably uh, some um, Also, uh, in uh, July, uh, Europe and the sentence goes in particular, Jawar, who enjoys enormous sway among the Keroyus, who led the protests and remain a force on the streets. Now here comes your sentence. Should unambiguously condemn lawlessness when he is released. Um, when did Jawar ever not condemn lawlessness? Why would even, the, the, what is the implication of that? Uh, I know you want to be, um, it's fair to take that at the face value on to make sure you are, uh, will condemn lawlessness, but we all do condemn lawlessness. And uh, the main lawlessness comes from uh, the regime. And uh, it, um, uh, it, it, by the way, Jari, the very person who disarmed 800 uh, OLF soldiers and uh, supported the government. And uh, he was a pacifist until he saw uh, uh, murders and killings by the army. Um, uh, at the personal level, um, I think uh, uh, our is not here, but uh, you also made, uh, made some, uh, some very naive comment uh, on, on your Facebook uh, where uh, somebody wrote, not you, someone else wrote ver the very purpose of the disgraced asylum seeker. Uh, uh, attack against the British citizen. This sounded like uh, a foul language to me. Uh, attacking a British citizen, close to racism, I would call it. You didn't write this, so I'm not going to blame you, but you the writer. Thank you, you said to him. So we have to be very careful uh, because a lot of the Oromo uh, and exaggerate it maybe, and even if they don't exaggerate, they're a little bit too far. Why am I mentioning this? Honestly, not to think I'm older, you know, by now the culture on our side, older people do advise young people, and I hope you will take the positive side, not necessarily uh, take it as an attack. It is not an attack. Coming to the question, I uh, don't think elections have any chance. How can you run elections while those uh, people who would be elected are in jails? All the uh, uh, parties that are objecting in opposition to the government, most of them are in jail, more than 10,000 from the researched regions of Amnesty International, more than 10,000 or almost, most of them will have uh, leaders and, and members are in jail. If you have any chance of influencing the people, you will be arrested and you will be in jail until the election is over and maybe even longer. So elections are uh, I, um, just as in the past or even worse. I don't put much hope in elections. It's going to be a political exercise.
uh, end, Ethiopia is facing a very, very serious um, political chaos. Uh, I, I read if Mary is stranger, and she wrote on Ethiopian side, by the way, she wrote, all the while bloodletting on a fertile unknown scale looms larger every day in Ethiopia. And if the country truly burns, as arguably, if it already is, then for globalization. And I underline this and listen to this sentence. And this terrifying eventuality should be broadcast from every rooftop and called out by its name while it is still time. And then perhaps, just perhaps, the Ethiopian melting pot will not go up in flames. And we are talking about elections. What elections? I think uh, the ambassador said it in 91, the TPLF recognized them because they won the war. They won the war. Whoever wins the war is going to control again. And transitional government, which will incorporate, bring all opposition leaders to the table, is the only peaceful option, which I don't bet on. So I must bet on winning the war. And uh, I really wish um, indefinite editors uh, and journalists of that caliber and uh, writers of that caliber as William, see the danger looming. It, this piece I saw at, in August, not too long ago, by Eve Mary Stranger, not an Oromo, probably not even an Ethiopian. And she read it very well. How come? People with such a high caliber cannot see where Ethiopia is going. In okay. what elections? Thank you. Thank you for your answer. We have more questions, so I'll just uh, keep going with the next one. The next one is to Mr. Herman Cohen, and Zalalem will read it out. Okay, this, um, this question, the second question to Ambassador Cohen piggybacks on the first one. Um, the contributor of the question talks about uh, your role as an architect of Ethiopia's Transitional Charter in 1991 and, um, and asks the following question. With the leverage of a lifetime experience at your disposal and your power of being heard among the policy giants in your native United States and in fact across Western Europe, how could you be helpful in the in the democratic? I'm sorry, in the diplomatic arena, to help the, uh, incorporate the OLF in the central role it may deserve in Ethiopia's political power constellation, if lasting peace and stability is what the international community is seeking to see in that part of the world. Thank you. Well, I believe the question is talking about now. What can we do now? I believe so, yes. And uh, of course, I'm not in government now, I'm retired. And <clears throat> I'd like to point out that the current U.S. Assistant Secretary of State, uh, Mr. Tibor Naj, has been ambassador to Ethiopia. So he, he knows the country quite well. And uh, I don't know what his intentions are. I heard him answer a question uh, about the situation uh, with the Romia, and uh, he said, well, I think Ethiopia is fine. Everything is fine in Ethiopia. Uh, maybe he was just trying to be diplomatic, but I'm sure he understands that everything is not fine. So can the United States make a contribution to the internal affairs uh, of Ethiopia? The United States tends not to do that uh, if, we can, if we can stay out. We'd like to allow the people of Ethiopia to to control their own affairs. Although I see in, in a number of countries in Africa where we, we do get involved. I remember when uh, the emperor abolished the federation with Eritrea. Uh, 
we were called in by the foreign minister. The U.S. ambassador was called into the foreign by the foreign minister. He says, "We're very disappointed, Mr. Ambassador. You did not congratulate us on the reunification of Ethiopia. In other words, we we showed our disappointment by not congratulating." So I don't see right now, as an outsider, as a retiree, how the U.S. can influence uh, the situation in Ethiopia. By the way, there are other interests there. Uh, we want the Ethiopians to continue to be opposed to the Al-Shabaab in Somalia. I noticed that Ethiopia is no longer an element in fighting Al-Shabaab. And we'd like Ethiopia to support the the fight against the Islamic extremists in the Sahel, you see. So the United States looks at its overall interests and we tend not to get involved in the internal affairs uh, of Ethiopia. I believe that the current head of Ethiopia is moving toward a very authoritarian system. And I'm sure the US will be disappointed to see that but whether we will take action about it, I, I kind of doubt it. And we will say, well, Ethiopia will not be the only authoritarian country in Africa. So as long as we have good relations and our interests are served and we import that wonderful coffee, well, that's fine. <laughs> All right, thank you, Ambassador Thorne. Now, uh, the next question goes to William, Mr. William Davison. Um, you have insisted repeatedly on social media that the use of the social political term naftanya is, pro is problematic, and you have claimed that it incites violence against the Amara people. What empirical evidence or studies do you have to make such an outlandish claim about a well-known term that simply means a gunman who has settled on others' land? Furthermore, why do you neglect to critique the racist use of terms against other groups, such as the term Gala against the Oromos? Thank you. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, maybe, maybe first of all, some of the points that uh, Asfal made. Um, so diversifying sources. Yeah, I mean, I guess the question would be like, you know, got someone accusing me of talking about things that I don't know about. What information does the interrogator have? about the diverse or otherwise nature of my sources? I don't know, like it just seems to be a kind of, there's some built-in assumptions there. In terms of Doward, um, I think I've met Doward like two or three times over the last couple of years. Obviously he was not in the country before that. Uh, you know, re re regular conversations with Lemmy Benya. Um, also, you know, met Shigut and, and corresponded with Shigut a couple of times, uh, including in the meetings with Doward. Um, you know, people I work very closely with are very in touch with OLF affairs. So I, I, I don't know, like, I, I'm just not sure that's based on particularly solid information. At the same time, I'm being accused of, of talking about things that I, I don't know about. So, yep, you know, we could talk more about these things. I would just like to reiterate, there might be, you know, more important things to talk about in this forum as I see it. I understand, um, you know, interesting point about Asamenal and, and how he wasn't a um, factor. Um, I think that Asamano had been engaged in some quite destabilizing and provocative activity in, you know, Oromia um, special zone of Amhara, um, and there had been violence in, in that area. I think that was what that was referenced to was in the report. Um, and then there was also Asamano's um, aggressive attitude towards, you know, the alleged uh, uh, annexed uh, Amhara territories and, and Tigray in, in general. Um, so um, the issue of um, I, I didn't understand the point about uh, the Facebook comment, but you know, these are things that I understand, things that I've written over like you know, fairly voluminous output. Like I will make mistakes. Um, at times I will say inappropriate things on social media. Um, you know, my understanding is that, um, well, overall I try and um, deal responsibly with these issues, but that's not to say I don't make mistakes and say irresponsible things um, at, at time. Um, maybe Asphal can remind me of his, um, um, anyway, I'll have to move on. So with regards to the Neftenia um, issue, so I would, take, I would take issue with the idea that I have repeatedly raised this on social media. I haven't. I have questioned the use of it, the prominent use of it, um, by um, activists like Awal, 
Like, I feel like it's become such an important term. It's a, it's a, it's a marker of your positioning on Ethiopia's very divided political spectrum. Either you say, you know, yes, it's just a term that was uh, applicable originally in the colonial era, and that's the usage that we're doing, and it has no, uh, there's no reason to have concern about its usage now. Um, or instead you take the complete polar opposite view, which is that it's a dog whistle, it's a racist dog whistle um, that's used uh, to try and encourage you know, discrimination and attacks on Amhara people, particularly Amhara people living on, in Oromia. When you have someone like me, who's uh, you know, an observer, um, a commentator, an analyst, an editor, who's watching this political debate unfold, you're just highlighting the fact that there is a very serious political debate which is centered around the, t the use of this term, nephthenia. Now, fair enough, you know, what empirical studies are you relying on? Yeah, not much. You know, it was just like questioning the use of this term by activists. Um, as it happens, you know, reporting from on the ground, it does suggest um, that the term has been used when incidents of violence have ensued. Like I was talking to a, an NGO, an Ethiopian NGO recently, who is monitoring um, hate speech on social media. Um, and they have already reached some conclusions about the use of the term um, neftenia. I'm not saying anything definitive here. I'm just saying that this is a legitimate area of debate. And this is the point that was being raised, yes, in very forthright fashion um, in this you know, offending Ethiopia insight column. But I stand by the claim that it is a legitimate area of debate. It is feeding into a polarized and ultimately toxic and violent political environment. And it is something that we need to discuss and highlight. And that is what I was doing. So, you know, that's essentially my understanding of the Nathaniel debate. Now, I think, sorry, I, I've sort of lost the thread on, on one of Asphal's um, queries to me. So if he wants to remind me of that, then go for it. Or perhaps we want to move on to other issues. I will just repeat the second part of the question. It will, furthermore, Thanks. why did you neglect to critique the racist use of terms against other groups, such as the term Gala against the Oromos? Oh, I guess my understanding is, again, that, um, you know, that the type of intercommunal violence that we're seeing um, in Ethiopia, at least there are far more prevalent allegations and reports of this occurring in Oromia. I'm aware of continued use of the racist term um, that you mentioned, um, and that would become an issue of prominent political concern if there were allegations that it was leading to serious violence. Um, in the way that Neftenia is. So it's not really like any kind of discrimination. Um, it's not like I prefer to talk about one allegedly racist discriminatory term than the other. It's just that my perception of events is that there is far more political importance attached to the use of the term Neftenia um, than the other racist derogatory term that you mentioned. But I would like to reiterate that the idea that I have repeatedly raise this concern and I'm engaging in some sort of campaign on this issue is just, it's just baseless. I have commented on it and I've explained those comments on it, but it is, has been nothing like a concerted campaign um, on my regard. But I was actually referring to something that, that Aspal said as well. So if, if, like I say, if he wants to remind me of that, then go for it um, and I will try and address it. Thanks. It's short, uh, Professor Aspel, then I'll give you the chance. Yeah, it, the last one I think was about what you, uh, what was written on your Facebook and the way you reacted to, uh, I don't want to aggrandize this guy, I don't want to mention his name, but he was, uh, he wrote very purpose of the disgraced asylum seeker in referring to our, um, uh, and his attack against a British citizen you see the word asylum, disgraced asylum seeker in British, this is, is being racial. And I would leave it at that. And, and I'm not blaming you because you didn't write that. But you thanked the guy who wrote said that. That's where I had. Yeah, I, I don't know. Like, I, I, I don't know. I, I just, I don't know how consequential this stuff is in, in the grand scheme of things. I, I, you know, I'm furious with Awal for the nature of his attack on me. It's been an entirely, an almost entirely identity-based attack. And if I make a few stray comments, thanking someone for defending me on Facebook, yeah, you know, maybe that's not perfect. You can categorize that as a mistake. Uh, you can highlight that. Um, I'll put my hands up. It doesn't sound like the most, um, you know, it doesn't sound like the sort of a comment that should be acknowledged, but that really stems 
from the outrageous identity-based attack of Awal on me and by implication, the website that I run. Thank you, that's enough for me. I appreciate that. Okay, we go on. Great. The next question goes to Ambassador Herman Cohen. What advice do you have to share to Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed about how, about how his administration is performing, its failures to democratize, its crackdown on opposition groups, and its failure to address the Oromo questions raised in the Oromo protests? If these failures continue, where do you think the country is headed? Uh, well, my advice to, uh, to the Prime Minister is, please do not fear democracy. Do not feel that you have to exercise total control as all of your predecessors in order to have a, an efficient government. It is just the opposite. You will not have an efficient government. You will have dissidents and rebellion all over. And I can see what's happening now in Tigray. So do not fear democracy. It will be good for Ethiopia. It will be good for you, be good for your legacy. I know that one of your best friends is the president of Eritrea, who's also a good friend of mine. Do not use him as a role model for government because his role model is Mao Zedong. And that was not good for China, it will not be good for Ethiopia. So please do not fear true democracy, accept it. Thank you. Thank you for your answer. Uh, the next question is gonna be read by Ate Lensa. And it goes to William Davison. Adelensa, are you still here? Yes, I am here. Yes, Thank you. Um, the question says here for Mr. William Davidson, how do you think a fair and free election could be conducted when, uh, just to point out, the ruling party that is um, just unilaterally extended its mandate and is now deemed illegitimate by almost all of the opposition voices. Everything in its power to disfranchise its opposition leaders closed regional, local offices of the OLF throughout Oromia and detained more than half of the potential candidates of the organization. Did you hear me? Yeah, yeah, thanks, Lenza. Yeah, it was a little bit broken, but I got it. Um, so, yeah, so I, I mean, I, I guess in one of my previous um, answers, I kind of described a similar electoral condition. Um, and I, obviously, I, you know, I, obviously I haven't said that, um, that I think there are other conditions for a free and fair election. So I, I guess I'll just try and answer the question sort of constructively as in there's a shared analysis between me and the questioner and then what could we do about it? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I, I think we're in like a huge amount of trouble um, in terms of you know, the, the, this type of uh, political, um, the political repression that, that we've seen and, you know, people can argue, you know, and I have to engage in these types of debates <clears throat> with, you know, diplomats and whoever, oh, you know, let the, um, you know, can someone mute, please? Um, you know, you have these sort of debates where, <clears throat> you know, I'm saying, well, how can you have a free and fair election now all the Oromo nationalist opposition have been arrested? And they say, oh yeah, but no, they're not political arrests, you know, they've just been arrested because they commit a crime. And then you say, well, that's not what the Oromo people seem to think, you know, predominantly. So there's a problem of perception. Um, and this is just absolutely massive. And as, as I see these, you know, criminal cases unfolding, um, you know, quite apart from the other uh, instances of oppression that was referred to, as I see these cases unfolding, I see very little chance that anything's going to happen with these judicial uh, procedures to actually give people confidence that the arrest of the um, opposition leaders was, was legitimate. So this really creates a huge political problem in terms of the perception of the election 
Um, if our main or more opposition political parties um, do not buy into the process and, and large you know, swathes of the Oromo electorate do not buy into the process, then it's going to be very, very hard to have a credible election. Um, you know, again, in my intro remarks, um, you know, I, I referred to the need for some sort of comprehensive political negotiation at this point. I, I don't see the continuation of the unilateral approach to these extraordinary political circumstances that we have from PP and the federal government as leading to democratic advancement in Ethiopia. I think we need a reset. Um, that reset ultimately would need to involve some form of political amnesty for the arrested leaders. And then there would have to be discussions about these other aspects of political repression so that we truly have the opportunity for a free and fair election, mobilization, fundraising, campaigning, recruitment, and all of these things that are vital components of a free election. We don't have those circumstances at the moment. So unless there's some sort of reset, um, then I think that we're going to be leading to another very unsatisf unsatisfactory democratic uh, exercise in Ethiopia. Um, I've managed to read my, my, scr my scrawled notes from ASPA. So it, it, the, the point was, um, what was Crisis Group on about when we said that Jawa should unambiguously condemn um, violence upon his release? Like, your know, point taken, um, <clears throat> you know, you know, the issue of Jawa and, you know, whether he's, you know, a force for good or a force for bad is another one of these hot button issues. As you know, um, I find myself in the middle of that. I, to be honest, I find myself defending uh, Jawa a lot. Um, I had my run-ins with him in the past, um, but we've had a very constructive relationship over the last couple of years. Um, and I do find myself defending him. I think when it comes to crisis group, putting together a statement um, in the midst of this very heated political environment, um, that we've seen recently, these sorts of statements come out. And I think almost as acknowledged by Aspal, it can never be a bad thing for a political leader to come out and unambiguously condemn violence. Um, maybe there is a sort of unfortunate insinuation that that hasn't happened enough in the past. Um, and I understand the complaints on that. But like I said, you know, it can never be a bad thing, especially given the sort of political environment that we have in Ethiopia, for all Ethiopian political leaders to come out and unambig unambiguously condemn violence. And I think the recommendation directed at Jawa should be taken in that spirit. <coughs> we'll continue with the next question. Apozalala, I, I should um, answer Ayantu's question at some point, but let me know when you want me to do that. Of course, we'll take the live questions. Um, yeah, okay, you can do that. We will take the live question. Mm -hmm. we'll, we'll, we'll go on. Okay. Know, let, 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 me, let, let me go through the chat. I see there's more stuff in there since I was speaking. So let me go through the chat and I'll answer, the, I'll answer them all together in a minute. All right, then we will continue with Abozalala. Okay, all right. So this next question goes to uh, Ambassador Kohanaswa. Uh, the contributor of this question talks about the uh, London uh, 1991 conference, your role in that conference. Uh, your famous assurance at the time, uh, no democracy, no cooperation, uh, and then goes on to talk about, uh, um, you know, other events at the time, but ask these two uh, very important questions. And those are, uh, has the United States abandoned its commitment to support democracy in Ethiopia under Abiy? What recourse do forces of democracy in Africa have when nonviolent peaceful resistance is ignored by the US? And the second question is, what is the nature of the so-called rapprochement between uh, Ethiopia and Eritrea? Is there any formal recognition of this change in relationship? Any agreement in writing? Any treaty or document approved by parliament or by, uh, auto but, I'm sorry, by authorities in Eritrea? Well, thank you. Uh in terms of, of uh, the, the London conference uh, uh, where we said no democracy, no cooperation. Well, uh, we thought that the, the beginning of government uh, after the London conference was, was going fairly well. And we don't think uh, that Ethiopia had democracy, but yet it was not too bad. And we felt that, that it was worth cooperating and and providing foreign assistance and all that. And we felt that at least on the economic side, uh, Ethiopia was making a lot of progress. So uh, 
we felt that uh, all things considered that uh, cooperation should continue. And I, I feel, feel that was a good decision. Ethiopia is one of the most important countries in Africa. Uh, and we should, we should try to work with them as much as possible. Now, the second question, you want to remind me of that? That was the... Uh, what were you that saying? was the nature of repro rapprochement between Ethiopia and Eritrea. Is yes. there any formal recognition of this changed relationship and any agreements or writing that you know of? Any treaties, documents approved by the parliament? Well, of I don't think this was a, a rapprochement so much as it was ending the war. You know, there, there were many troops in both countries on the border because they had never really decided. Uh, Mela Zanawi accepted the Algiers Agreement and the deline delineation of the border. But there continued to be a lot of tension. And until uh, Prime Minister Abi and uh, President Isayas formally declared that all hostilities are ended and we will remove our troops from the border. I think it was essentially a final act in an earlier peace agreement. And we think this is wonderful. We no longer have to look to the Eritrean Ethiopian border as a source of tension, as a possible, as a possible beginning of hostilities. This is we put this behind us now. This is wonderful. Uh, one disappointment I had was that when I had Melissa Nawi and Isaias in the same room, I said, I know there's going to be an independent Eritrea, but I, I implore you to have a common market, a common market, because both sides benefit from the trade between Eritrea and Ethiopia. Well, this, this, was true for a while. It was true for several years, but finally with the creation of the NACFA and other impediments, the common market disappeared. I will urge both uh, Isaias and Abi now, take a good look at the possibility of a common market. This will be the benefit of both populations. Okay, thank you for your question. So we have only two questions left and they are both for you, Mr. William Davison. Uh, so I'll just suggest we will finish the questions and then you can answer to Ayantu, if it's okay. So um, the uh, next question is, what do you think of the implement implication of the widespread arbitrariness in the justice system in particular that is signaling how the ruling clique in the country is almost on the verge of being in disgrace sooner or later. An example of such arbitrariness is being widely witnessed when suspects who are being set free by the court are rounded up on the spot by uniformed armed men and horrored into jail with no further explanation again. So in the wake of such clear signals of looming crisis, who did the diplomatic community of Fifine choose to appease the defunct interim prime, prime minister whose legitimacy is in question in the first place? Um, yeah, I mean, um, there certainly has been plenty of, um, plenty of evidence of, of inst instances of that, those kinds of violations of um, of, of due procedure. Um, I mean, again, I think, you know, we're looking at a continuation of, of, of practices um, that we saw under the EPRDF regime, um, where, you know, f you know, far from having a, you know, a judiciary that was independent and, 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 and you know, your criminal trials that were conducted with high qualities of, uh, high quality of evidence and procedure um, instead, you know, we just saw, we just sort of see you know, the, the judicial processes just being used as a matter of kind of politics by other means. Um, and it's, you know, this is actually sort of described aptly, aptly to me by someone who'd been inside the system. And I think we should remember there are people inside the system who are trying to improve things, but they were just making the point that, you know, whilst you might be an individual prosecutor or, or judge or someone in the, 
you know, in, 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 in the government, um, in that area of government, you're trying to do the right thing. There were always actors, you know, whether they're in the police or whether they're politicians who were playing out their grudges um, and essentially engaged in all sorts of political acts that perverted um, the justice system. And I think this is, um, there is evidence of this and it does look like a continuation um, and it belies the claims um, that we've seen significant reform in Ethiopia, uh, particularly of the criminal justice system. Um, and we should also note that, you know, any, I think any, you know, any sort of generally sort of under-resourced justice system is going to struggle just with a huge number of arrests uh, over the 9,000 and then the, the 4,000 plus prosecutions that we've seen or we're seeing, you know, any justice system is going to struggle with that. Um, and I think one which is as under-resourced and as under-reformed as Ethiopia's is certainly, we're certainly seeing the sort of negative um, impact of that. Um, okay, so let me turn to a couple of um, Ayantu's points. Um, yeah, I, I, well, okay, so I mean, it's always good if criticism is specific as possible. So I kind of note that uh, Ayantu has said, well, I've reviewed um, the articles, you know, haven't said which ones, and it's like, and, I, and I've formed a conclusion from them. Um, and then, you know, based on that conclusion, um, I have surmised um, that I am actively setting the agenda. There's only one thing there, which I think is sort of not contentious. And that's which Ethiopia Insight engages in heavy editing of each and every article. We do that to try and improve the standard of the writing um, and generally to try and improve the standards of the writing. There's no secret there. There's also should be no secret considering the amount of research Iantu has done that there is not a single word including the headline and the subheadings, the intro, which is not the case in all media, there is not a single word which goes out without the approval of the author. So I'm not quite sure how that factors into Iantu's thesis. But really to answer the question properly, given the research that Iantu has done, she would actually have to be much, much more specific um, in how she formed these conclusions, which she then bases her, um, her question or, you know, her sort of allegation on. Um, I think state violence against the Oromo, you know, like if you go back pre-June and you look at Ethiopia Insights coverage of the Wolaga issue through the reporting of Ermia's Tasfai, I don't see a single, I can't recall a single instance where we've described the state violence against Oromo civilians as being a result of Oromo attacks on other minorities. So we also see, seem to have a sort of slightly selective presentation of the evidence um, by Iantu there, because all of those articles about the situation in Welliger, none of them, not a single description, not a single phrase in the articles fit that thesis. Um, so I am not using the phrase Oromo nationalist as a pejorative um, with regards to Abraham's question. The, the, it, it is shorthand. Um, I realize it's a catch-all, but it's really to say, you know, those who support the position of the Oromo as a political is multinational federal system. So I'm not using Oromo nationalist as a pejorative, therefore I struggle to understand why that would be a problem. Um, can you hear me? It's telling me my connection is unstable. Let me know if it is. Um, so with regards to Iantu's uh, second lengthy uh, kind of question here, well, first of all, the Human Rights Commission has been engaged in research um, about the events after Hachalu's death in Oromia. So that's one entity. The Oromia Attorney General's Office has been engaged in extensive um, investigations um, following the, the violence um, that stemmed from Hachalu's killing. So that's another organization. Human Rights Watch has been engaged in extensive research following the events in early July after Hachalu's killing. So that's just wrong. Um, in terms of the media, um, probably best just to speak for myself. Um, after taking a trip um, to Batu uh, in early September, uh, we decided to focus a piece on trying to do a sort of anatomy um, of one instance of violence um, that followed Hachalu's death. Um, we're still working on that piece. It's incredibly difficult. Um, even in these one instances, one town, you get fantastically polarized narratives. Um, obviously, we've got access problems as usual in terms of obtaining the government's view, um, but that piece should be published on Ethiopia Insight relatively soon. And again, belies Iantu's um, essentially you know, ill-informed suggestion that no one has looked into the July violence. 
Um, again, you know, a conclusion stems from this, which is just based upon these erroneous assumptions. Like, when, you know, at, at what point specifically um, have you know, we simply been contented to conveniently blame the Oromo youth for all of the mayhem? The point of the exercise that we're doing at Ethiopia Insight is to investigate these allegations of conspiracy, to investigate these allegations of the actions of mercenaries, you know, to try and work out what, you know, if there was premeditation, whose premeditation was it? These are open questions for inquiry, as far as I am concerned, as far as I'm, the website is concerned, and I presume they are open areas of inquiry for anyone else from the other listed organizations who are looking into these issues. Um, and then we're moving, of course, um, onto this, um, common, this commentary by Sahin Tefera, um, criticizing Awal um, for his use of the phrase Neftenya, his failure to be a constructive voice um, um, as, uh, in her view. Um, Ethiopia Insight strives to be a diverse platform. That means it strives to represent almost all perspectives from across Ethiopia's political spectrum. What that means is it does not just publish viewpoints by people who share the political views of Iantu. It shares, it publishes the political viewpoints of people who disagree with almost everything Iantu says. That's why we end up um, with this, that's why I end up making the decision to publish this sort of column. Whether we like it or not, there are organized political forces in Ethiopia, there are political elites, and there are ordinary Ethiopians who really resent some of the activism that Awal has been engaged in. If it was just one voice, Sahin, who held this view and came to me with this column, I wouldn't have published it. But we all know that Sahin is representing an important part of the Ethiopian political constituency. Given that the website strives to be a platform for all of Ethiopia's political perspectives, there you have the understanding of why the article was published. In terms of the exact phrasing, um, I've discussed at length uh, this, um, this sentence that, that, um, that I am to quote there. Um, that can be read in a couple of different ways. It could certainly have been phrased better. Um, and then there was also the sort of blind hatred element that could also have been edited better. You know, this is a mere culpa. You know, that's an editing mistake. Um, out of the 250 articles that I have edited for Ethiopia Insight, the articles do contain editing mistakes. Um, but I think that they should be kept in perspective. And I think there should be appreciation of the work that we're doing and of the efforts to create a common platform for all Ethiopian political parties to discuss their views in one place. Okay, thank you. We have one more question left. Uh, Opa Jamal, can you read it out? And afterwards, I will give it back to you, Dr. Trevor. And um, yeah, and maybe you can give other people the chance to talk their piece. Thank All you. right, thank you, Adesora. Uh, here goes a question. Uh, uh, the question is to Mr. William. Please tell us what you think the nature of political crisis is that the Oromo people and other marginalized nations in Ethiopia are facing right now. What do you think is the role of neighboring African countries, the African continent, as well as the international community in preventing or combating this crisis? That's one question. The next question was, it is clear from the records kept by the Prosperity Party that over 700 youths were killed in the first three weeks after Haj Alu's death or assassination. Since then, the number has grown to well over 1,000. But the media have never reported or pursued to, to report these figures. Why do you think the killings in Oromia are underreported? Why they are covered very little? And why do you think Oromos who are the victims of the violence are Portrayed, portrayed as perpetrators. The second question regarding media goals, why had the media and have any rights group not raised alarm about the massive number of killings of this, the, the last three months? In a very similar way, there is coverage of every incident in Benishan Gulgumuz, but even the killings of children in Romia are not reported. How do you explain this? And the other two questions for you as a person. 
what are your role in international crisis group and what is your role in uh, at ethiopian insight if the destruction and the killings of minorities in the, in the days following Haj Alu's killings were instigated by the government security forces themselves. Why is that blamed on Oromo use? And how would you come to know about the factors when you didn't visit the area? And how would you expect the killings in Oromia, including that of Haj Alu's, can be uh, investigated by an independent body in Ethiopia? Is there any possibility? So those are the questions. My personal question to you, why do you see the word Naftanya as negative when those who claim to be Naftanya are very proud of it? They are claiming and on the streets, they say we are Naftanya and we are very much proud of it. Why do you think it is negative? Thank you. Well, wow. um, yeah, I, I don't know. Like, I always find it helpful if people ask questions one at, one at a time. I mean, you're just going to get like a reduced quality of answer from that barrage. Um, I, I'll do my best. Um, yes, yeah, so the you know, nature of the crisis, international community. Um, I mean, I, you, know, I, I, you know, I think clearly, like, you know, these sort of kind of high profile concerns about um, centralization, um, the undermining of, of regional autonomy. Um, you know, whether expressed by the TPLF or Oromo nationalist opposition, they're also being expressed elsewhere uh, by other Ethiopian uh, political communities. Um, they are real. Um, they, they, they threaten to have a you know, very major impact um, if this kind of unilateral e effort to manage, sorry, turn this WhatsApp off, if this unilateral effort to manage um, this transition continues, um, and if we see a continuation of this type of centralization, under, under Prosperity Party, I think that's clear. Um, in terms of the international community, um, I do worry um, about the, you know, the extent of understanding in the international community, the quality of their analysis, and as ever, you know, they're willing to act in a decisive, timely, constructive manner. Um, if we're going to be realistic about what the international community could do, I think you know, to form some sort of consensus amongst key donors that the trajectory Ethiopia is on is a very worrying one. Um, and you know, the idea of having a competitive transformative election is fanciful at this stage. And therefore there would need to be a significant reset uh, to the transition to get things back on track. And ultimately all that would amount to is some sort of consensual analysis and understanding um, from the so-called international community and then beginning to apply a bit more, um, you know, a bit more influence, um, you know, being clearer um, to, the, to the federal government in particular uh, that they think that a, a more consultative approach needs to be taken. I think realistically, given where we are, you know, given the huge amount of support uh, for this government, the investments that have been made, the awarding of the Nobel Peace Prize, and then other um, factors that impact this situation, you know, we have to be realistic about the extent which the international community is going to perform some sort of 180 degree U-turn. But they should be able to come to a reasonable um, and, and more uh, accurate analysis of the situation and start to advise the government that the current trajectory is untenable. Um, yeah, so I, th I think this issue of media balance that that's comes up today is, is I, you know, I said in this in the answer to, to Trevor before, um, or you know, ref referenced Trevor's work. Um, I think this issue of media balance is, is, is very, very important. Um, I, I think it's fair to point out that, you know, the, the, the violence in Metacal Zone recently has had considerable more publicity than, um, than violence um, in, in Walaga. Uh, there is, the, again, the obvious point that access is, is hard out there, um, but then there is also the reports you know, by the OSG and other entities um, which shine a light on, on what's going on out there. Um, you know, I think we do have a problem of, um, you know, ur you know, like, you know, essentially like urban um, media narratives predominating. I, th I think that is a factor. Obviously the, you know, the, the Oromo, um, political constituency has really improved its ability to get its out messages out in the past. Um, but I think this does create problems. What I would say is that, you know, as you know, my former career as a wire reporter, if you get, you know, a well-written, crisp press release, uh, sort of contemporaneous, you know, documenting contemporaneously, um, describing exactly what's happened, 
in very factual language, you know, without too much, you know, political rhetoric in there, just saying, you know, this happened in the Kemp, you know, this happened in Kelem Wallaga, um, it happened, you know, and then, you know, you know, contact us if you want further information. The more people can pump out that kind of press release, stick that in the inbox of international correspondents, the more coverage you will get. Um, and so, you know, these are kind of simple methods that could be improved to try and correct this balance that I think you have correctly identified. Um, ICG role and Ethiopia Insight role, I mean, that's, you know, that's, that's on, the, on the web. Um, I'm ICG Senior Analyst for Ethiopia and I'm the, the founder and editor um, of, of Ethiopia Insight. Um, I think this issue of um, you know, what exactly went on in July um, is, you know, seismically important. You know, as discussed before, there's two very polarized narratives. Um, about what happened in, the, um, in, in this, this violent period following Hachalu's killing. Um, there is a lot more research to be done. I mean, as you know, to be fair to Ayantu, as she correctly points out, there is research ongoing. Um, so in that, um, in that manner, we're just waiting for publication and finalization of that research. But there is certainly more to be done to work out exactly um, what happened, um, you know, what, what, what happened in, in, in July. And this idea of an independent investigation is absolutely critical. Um, in the Ethiopian political condition. We have, um, you know, we have uh, politicized narratives, we have gossip, we have conspiracy theories, uh, we have all types of propaganda. Um, they are predominating and they are essentially just in infecting um, the political discourse. Um, if this continues, it's just going to accelerate and worsen, as I see it. Um, there is no suggestion that people are really talking to, to each other across political divides. We just have amplified political narratives going on in their own direction, which is eventually going to lead us down the path of further conflict. The idea of an independent investigation into some of these very serious political events um, we've seen in recent history is a fantastic idea. The issue, of course, is how do you constitute such an independent investigation in the Ethiopian political context? When the UN refers to this, the UN um, Office of Commission for Human Rights, they, they talk about the government handling an inv independent investigation. Well, you know, half of Ethiopia's political constituency is blaming the government for being involved in these events. So it's going to have to be something more than that. Um, you know, perhaps if the Human Rights Commission um, manages to improve its capacity, as I think it's showing signs of doing, um, showing signs of, of autonomy, I know others disagree, but if the Human Rights Commission um, can continue to improve and show genuine independence and impartial and equitable concern for all of the human rights violations in Ethiopia. Could the Human Rights Commission be empowered at some point to perform that sort of role? Or could we have some sort of formation of a special commission, um, you know, with opposition figures and neutral figures on the commission um, accountable to parliament, although that's not much use at the moment because parliament's controlled by one party. So there's all sorts of structural and political impediments to an inve independent investigation, but the need for one is absolutely um, it should be obvious to all observers to try and shine some credible and impartial light on some of these very murky and hugely consequential violent political events we've seen. Um, yeah, some people claim um, ownership of the term neftenia. I'm not sure how many people do that. And I would posit the suggestion that for as many people who claim ownership of the term neftenia as something they are proud of, there are far, far more people who are concerned about its usage um, within some political narratives. So I, I do acknowledge that there is some ownership of the claim, but I don't think that, um, I don't, I don't think that um, you know, ref refutes or, or cancels out the fact that there are others who are also describing it as a racist dog whistle, um, uh, which, which applies to Amhara and is designed to, um, and which is designed to um, instigate um, you know, some form of political action against Amhara. That's the allegation, at least. I think just to round off on, up on this point quickly, um, th there are obviously allegations that, um, that, that the Prime Minister Abiy and the Prosperity Party and the, the, the people contained within are leading you know, some sort of neo-Neftenia, sort of neo-imperial um, administration. There was also the allegation that Hachalu faced death threats um, from people who were upset by his criticism of Menelik. And those people were often described as Neftenya. Or well, they were, you know, they were described as Neftenya. When Hachalu was killed, my understanding is that there was considerable blame 
placed upon those elements who have been identified as Neftenia, whether that is the government itself or whether it's sort of, you know, Amhara, urban, Shoan, um, non oromo elites. You know, that was a popular perception. Now, I don't want to draw too tight a kind of chain of, of logic here, um, but there did seem to be the allegation that Charlu was killed by Neftenia that was understandably absolute fury and sorrow across Oromia at Ha Charlu's killing. Um, and as much as you know, this, this narrative and, and the harm it's been done may well prove to be exaggerated. And as someone pointed out, the empirical evidence proving the connection between you know, elite activist use of Neftenia and killings on the ground, the empirical work has not been done. You know, I would point to these kind of sort of circumstantial um, events surrounding Hachalu's death and the use of the term that I think are at least worth examining. All right, Dr. Trevor, would you take on? Thank you very much, uh, Sura, and thank you for doing that. And I'm sorry I forgot about it earlier. Um, uh, everyone, I am very conscious of the fact that we are uh, beyond time, um, but uh, with uh, William and Asfau's permission, I would like to continue so that we could answer some of the questions from the people in the audience on the Zoom thing. Would that be all right with you, William and Asfau? Yes, absolutely. William, have you, uh, are you still around? <laughs> You're muted, William. Sorry, I'm, gra I'm gradually losing my voice, but I'll keep going. Yeah. <laughs> are, you, are you still okay for a little while? Yeah, that's fine. Great, great. Okay, so we have uh, questions from the audience. I think the order is Daniel Dibaba, Guluma Gameda, HP, Banti, Mohammed Hassan, Garbi Nure, and Merertu Kitila. Now, I propose that we go on for about 15 minutes maximum. Um, after that, everybody's just going to be too tired, I think. So, Daniel, would you like to ask your question fairly quickly, please? Uh, thank you, Dr. Trevor. Um, thank you, everyone. Hi. Uh, good evening, uh, uh, Davidson, and uh, good morning, Dr. Uh, 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 Sir Cohen. Uh, first of all, I think it was William who said uh, Abiy Ahmad ca uh, came from uh, an Oromo block. Uh, and he himself doesn't see himself as an Oromo and uh, he doesn't have uh, like a sense of being an Oromo. He doesn't share um, the same mindset with the Oromo and so he's not, he's not an Oromo and when he received the Nobel Peace Prize. He, uh, his information was read as he is from an Amara uh, mother and an Oromo father or something, but I, don't, I, I, I really doubt he's an Oromo at all. Uh, he might have been brought up by an Oromo stepfather. And there is a rumor about that, uh, if that is really important. But, um, Abi Ahmad, as we all know, uh, came on the backdrop of the Oromo struggle uh, that reached climax from 2014 to 2018 and ended uh, in defeating um, the, the TPLF and the TPLS were convinced they should retreat back to Tigray. And then uh, the, uh, among the EPR Dev Coalition... Daniel, they... I'm sorry, I must interrupt you. As I said, we have about uh, six people wanting to ask questions. Um, really, if you cannot uh, reduce your question to about 10 seconds, then please deter, defer to somebody who can. Thank you. All right, I'll, I will, I'll try to summarize then. Uh, okay, so my question is actually, uh, one of my questions is, what do you think of the uh, uh, transitional Oromia government that was proposed, proposed by uh, Oromo Liberation Front and uh, Oromo Federalist Congress? This is a question for both of you. Um, Thank you, Daniel. I think we better stick with that. Okay. Okay, Asfau, briefly. Should we, should we do one question at a time? Or was Asfar answering? 
Now, that's a very good idea, William. We will do all the questions together. That's excellent. Okay. 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 Um, so, Guluma Gamada, can you ask your question? Briefly. Sorry, I was, I was saying the opposite. I was, I, was, I was confused as to whether Aspar was answering or uh, asking. Sorry, I, I much prefer doing one question at a time. Sorry for the oh. confusion. <laughs> okay, Aspar, over to you and then William. Uh, in the interest of time, my short answer is I'm fully on board with uh, uh, Obodaud's suggestion for transitional government of Oromia, and that shall be by hook or crook. Thank you. Okay, William. Yeah, I'll give a really short answer as well. I mean, I, th I think there's obvious, uh, it's obvious where the, the calls for that transitional government come from. The issue would be one of practicality. Um, you know, the federal government, the Oromia regional government as it exists, um, has been looking to consolidate and assert its power, take control of the political space. Um, you know, how on earth would we go about implementing that transitional government? So, you know, far more important, well, you know, more, more, more salient than the issue of whether a transitional government in Oromir is a good idea, is how would that be implemented? Because I don't see it as, um, you know, I, 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 yeah, I don't see it as something as immediately practical at all, let's say. Thank you very much. That's admirably brief. Um, HP. Uh, I think Dr. Trevor, uh, how about Dr. Uh, Mr. Cohen suggested that oh, the sorry. solution to oh, the political sorry. problem in Ethiopia yeah. is uh, decentralization. Can you listen, please? I, I'm sorry. Um, Herman Cohen had to leave. His grandchildren arrived. And uh, he left a message saying, Isaias is a role model for Abby not for the Oromo, which I thought was quite uh, significant. Okay, so now I would go on to HP, but she's vacated her chair. So Banti, Banti Ajulu, you, uh, you have your hand raised there. Sorry, sorry Trevor, I thought you um, gave me a chance and how can I ask? Oh, I'm sorry, Guluma, I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah, I know, I understand. I'm okay. sorry, purely my fault. All right, no, no, no problem. I understand. He has returned to uh, the seat. Yeah. Okay. Uh, can I go now? Yeah. But please make it brief. Okay, I will. I will try. I will try. Definitely sure. Yeah. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Um, 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 I would like to thank the speakers and for their patient, in fact, staying on to answer uh, some more questions. Uh, uh, my question, in fact, initially intended for uh, Ambassador Cohen and as well as uh, Mr. Davison, uh, but since Ambassador, I understand, has left, uh, so I'll focus on Mr. Davison, the question for him. Um, uh, well, uh, before I ask, my question is brief, but uh, before I ask, I just wanted to raise two things. One, I uh, appreciate uh, uh, his um, 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 work and particularly the Ethiopia inside lately accepting some articles from Oromo um, um, uh, individuals, uh, 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 intellectuals uh, on the major issues. Uh, that is encouraging. Uh, and I'm also understand and appreciate that uh, he wants to make it open for all to express their views at this platform, uh, just open to all, that's, that's good. But what I don't agree, and this has been uh, said uh, a lot, he has responded to this is, uh, I think sometimes uh, where, uh, when he inserts himself and takes the position uh, of, uh, of one of the uh, uh, different uh, competing views or contesting views there, uh, that's what I, uh, we don't appreciate. But as far as the forum remains open, uh, to all and we can debate and we'd like to debate and we'd like to to, to write and uh, uh, express our views there. Uh, that's welcome. Uh, and the second point related to this is this uh, term in um, uh, That's, I think, unfortunate uh, that uh, Mr. Uh, Davison... Uh, I'm sorry, Galuma, I have muted you. Um, if we're going to terminate this in 10 minutes, then we really have to be brief. If you cannot ask a question within 10 seconds, then please. Uh... Okay, just let me ask the question. I'll, I'll drop the rest. Uh, that's fine. I think we can take it up with uh, Mr. Davison later on. Uh, my question, I think, is partially answered, but let me ask anyhow. Uh, it's about uh, the, uh, the reporting uh, that uh, we um, 
I don't have uh, reliable reporting and that's one of an issue that he raised. Uh, but one of the problems contributing to that is the government's unwillingness, uh, not doing anything uh, uh, in providing accurate information or at least allowing uh, uh, independent uh, journalists uh, and other people to get uh, real information about the major incidents like the killing of Achalu. Uh, uh, several times, uh, in fact, uh, the Oromo, uh, on the Oromo side, have requested independent investigation of these major incidents. Uh, the government didn't do and want to do and doesn't like to do it. Uh, why not? I think uh, uh, the, uh, Mr. Davison and others insist on that and that the government accept uh, independent uh, inquiry into the major incidents uh, causing uh, the, uh, uh, the problem uh, there, that the government... Thank you, Galuma. Um, William, I, would you spend a second answering Galuma's claim there? Um, yeah, sure. So, I mean, I, you know, I, I think this sort of like, uh, you know, this sort of, just sort of trying to be constructive on the issue of uh, media weakness. Um, so it's, yes, yeah, it's, it's almost, you know, it's just kind of like, Im imagine, imagine if there was like, you know, strong independent uh, media outlets um, in each Oromia zone or, or in each major, you know, Ethiopia, Oromia urban location. Um, if there was, you know, that kind of like, you know, repu rep you know reputable, um, sort of institutionalized media, um, which was kind of reporting live on these on these situations it's you know just to say that we would be in a much much better situation in terms of assessing these events if that was in place of course that's not to say that that's something that can be um, created overnight and it, and it isn't to say to get to your question that there aren't government obstacles um, to those types of de developments i think we all know the story about sort of the media's underdevelopment in the epidf era oh, obviously there was a real tendency of the epidf not just to control in a physical fashion but also to control the flows of information. Um, and I think it's pretty obvious that Ethiopia is still suffering from that. The danger I see at the moment is that, you know, there is lots of concerns and lots of debate, as we've seen today, about kind of irresponsible speech, let's say. Um, but ultimately, Ethiopia suffers from a lack of reliable information. So we have all these concerns, we have a new hate speech law, uh, we have all this focus on irresponsible speech or alleged ir irresponsible speech. But kind of the issue that there isn't enough um, reliable. Um, information and flows of information, I feel like gets lost sometime. Um, you know, ultimately this issue of an independent investigation, I think I've covered it. Um, it's political, like almost everything. Um, and until the government signs up um, to allow itself to be investigated by a genuinely you know, impartial, capable, independent authority um, and takes measure, measures to provide all the cooperation and access and security, that's needed for those investigators to carry out its work, we are effectively nowhere. Um, so that, you know, that, that for me is the issue. It's, it's, it's not about the need for an independent investigation. Um, yes, the government can be implored to do so by you know, external and internal actors, but until the government actually buys into this um, and takes necessary measures, then um, you know, it's, it's, it's just going to remain something else on the wish list, really. Uh, thanks very much, William. Um, HP, your question, just 10 seconds, please. Any more, and I'm going to have to mute you. Unmute yourself. You will have to unmute. That's okay, thank you so much, Mr. Da, 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 Traver. Um, uh, I have two questions for the two, uh, uh, what do you call it, guests. One is, the first thing is for the, the what do you call it, uh, Mr. Williams. Mr. Williams. Uh, thank you for coming on this panel. You seem uh, more than a journalist. Really, the way you uh, uh, talk, uh, it looks like more than journalism. But I'm proud to call myself an Oromo and an Oromo nationalist to tell you, because you are referring one person or one person's uh, nationalism to this uh, panelist, because like Lynch Obati, for us, Oromo nationalists who uh, suffered under yoke of imperialism and, and capitalism, and on, the, on this time with the dictatorship of Abiy Ahmed supporting uh, uh, his government, uh, to me, uh, he's not a nationalist, I'll leave it to that. 
And I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you a question. The question I'm asking: Oromo wants sovereignty of their country. Uh, they want to be uh, what do you call it? Our struggle is not uh, like a, a cake or coffee or something like that. You're gonna say uh, a language or speaking in Addis Ababa, uh, the Oromo language. We want to be a sovereign country who can control his wealth and resources. Do you support? And the second question to Dr. William, uh, Mr. William, uh, you are a journalist. Uh, you seem biased, but I don't know really, but there are a lot of uh, biased journalists in America. But uh, do, you, do you report the activity, illegal activity of Isaiah Safawarki? in the Ethiopian government meddling in this government and his security is killing and murdering people? Do you report this? Do you have any idea as a journalist? This is my question. And the second- I'm sorry, I had to cut you off after that one question because so uh, we have to limit this somehow. William, would you like to come back to HP on that? Um, yeah, so Okay, it's a sort of starting misconception, I suppose. Um, so I'm not like I'm not a reporter um, anymore. I'm, I'm an editor and a publisher, and then I also have a job as a as a political analyst for Crisis Group. So I'm not a reporter. Um, you know, yeah, I, th I think this issue of um, Eritrean involvement in Ethiopian politics, um, I certainly agree with the with HP that um, this is something which is underexplored um, and potentially it's a very important matter um, that's underexplored. Um, and you know, I don't, don't want to you know, hide, hide behind this, but yeah, that's not my frontline job to be doing that now. I am an editor and an analyst. Um, I am having conversations about the issue, um, but it's not exactly an easy thing to report on. It's not exactly easily accessible information. Um, about those those types of things, so it's a it's a tricky one. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so I think yeah, so sort of like uh, we could be careful with how the the, the question was 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 phrased. Um, you know, I, I understand that there's my understanding is that there was plenty of popular support um, for Oromia's um, and the Oromo people's self determination and autonomy. Um, within the Ethiopian Federation. Um, and then I think as a kind of a objective matter of, of assessment, um, you know, the development of the, of the Federation has been stunted in many ways by the EPRDF's blanket control. Um, that's a kind of de facto one party state operation. So the idea of kind of autonomous policy making at the regional level didn't really materialize. And then we have that kind of centralization of power, which the ambassador was talking about um, which comes, um, you know, despite the formal federal setup. Um, and I was referring to issues about the kind of fiscal imbalances. So you can see that, you know, if there is, um, as there seems to be, um, you know, a strong Oromo demand for genuine autonomy, then we can kind of objectively identify that despite the on paper autonomy that the constitution grants, that hasn't actually been the de facto case. Um, so there is plenty of sort of progress that can be made there. I'm sorry, that's a bit of a diplomat's answer, but I, you need, have to be careful with this stuff. Okay. Well, I think, well, I certainly am getting rather tired now. Um, Banti, did you still want to raise a question before? Remember, you're summing up right at the end. Y yes, I, I just wanted, I have no question. I just wanted to okay, give... I, then let's stop there. You're going to sum up at the end anyway. So if okay. there's not a question, then that can be part of your summing up. Um, Sorry, I'm using chairman's Trevor, privilege. Yeah. Trevor, there's also a, a ton of questions in the, um, the chat that haven't been addressed as well. I'm, I'm, I don't suppose there'll be time for them, just to note that. I'm afraid not. <laughs> Mohammed, your question. Uh, thank you, Trevor. Um, uh, William, many questions were directed to you, not to attack you, but really to make you sensitive to our more issue. Uh, um, we just want you to have an objective uh, view about others as well as the Oromo. Uh, uh, secondly, uh, you said Awal is uh, uh, an activist. Awal is a fine scholar. 
He is also a committed scho uh, uh, scholar who raises issues. The issue he raises really touches all of us and dismissing him as, uh, as an activist is really not a, a right approach. Uh, if possible, it is best if, you know, uh, the, the relation between the two of you is cleared. Uh, and I regularly read, thank you for the Ethiopian Insight. I regularly read the Ethiopian Insight. To be honest with you, most of the time I curse myself sometimes for reading it because what is published is not sensitive to Oromo issue. I just want you to understand this, basically. And finally, if you want to understand uh, Naftanya, Naftanya is a system. There is a wonderful book by John Markakas, 1974. And you can clearly see the system that was established after Menelik that lasted all the way up to 1974. There is a valid reason why people fear Abiyi is restoring the Neftanya system under which it was impossible to speak in Oromo language. Up to 1974, you can't write anything in Ethiopia and they want to take us back to that one. And one has really to be very careful about this issue. Uh, uh, please, finally, please understand the issues were raised Honest to God, I feel not to attack you, but to make you sensitive. Look at our issue. Uh, uh, people who are vast in Ethiopia, not having a single independent radio in Ethiopia at the time, not a single uh, television in, in the country, everything, there are hundred uh, medias in Ethiopia, they all daily pump anti-Oromo uh, propaganda. And the people who live in Ethiopia, especially those who talk uh, government to government cadres, they usually adopt that idea, basically adopting the ideas of cadre. Nencho Bati is a government cadre, and he is feeding you with the government ideas, and their idea is to destroy Oromo nationalism, to dismantle Oromia. I have heard literally from Abiy Ahmed who said, I will destroy. And you know, our people struggled for so long to create an Oromia, and he is systematically, and those around him are systematically dismantling Oromia. To be frank with you, this is the final point. There is no Oromo government in Oromia now. It is controlled by PP, and the goal is to restore the old Ethiopia of one language, one culture, one identity, and everything. And I am done. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Trevor. Thank you, Mohammed. You made your point very forcefully. William, you, would you like to respond to that? Um, yeah, yeah. Just, just maybe, just quickly. Um, yeah. So, I mean, obviously, yeah. Thank you for those points, Mohammed, and and obviously, I, you know, I do try and um, I do try do try and take these issues as as seriously as, as possible, and, and, and listen to, um, to listen to the to the various grievances and, and, and criticisms, and, and try and gain as as good an understanding as possible, and, and deal with them as responsibly as, as possible through the various pieces of work I do. Um, so you know, even if there are sort of differences in understanding and analysis, um, you know, please rest assured that there is a, a genuine effort to try and um, do this, this this stuff I do as as well as possible. Um, yeah, no offense on the, uh, on the activist thing. And, um, I'm not, you know, I'm not, <clears throat> I'm not downplaying uh, our world's academic achievements, um, by referring to his activism. Um, but it, it is his activism rather than his scholarly work that has led 
to him mounting a campaign of defamation against me. So I think if I'm a little bit preoccupied um, with his activity as an academic, as an activist, sorry, rather than an academic, I think it's probably um, for that for that reason. Um, yeah, you know, you know, I think this um, you know, to maybe <clears throat> try and say something on the on the Neftenia um, issue. I'm not. I wouldn't dream of saying anything definitive on this type of topic. It, it feels like the sort of thing that will be endlessly debated. Um, I, I, I'm aware of the concerns that you express. Um, and, you know, when I've had, you know, government officials or read in Prime Minister's office statement that, oh, you know, that the revolution came in 1974 and the imperial system ended. So why are you still harking back to that period? I find these, you know, woefully inadequate as explanations. You know, obviously what we're talking about is the legacies um, of historic discrimination, um, formalized, institutionalized discrimination, the legacies of that. Um, and the impact that it has today. So on the one hand, we have those legacies to deal with as, as we have the legacies of institutionalized racism to deal with in a bunch of places, um, including obviously my own country. So that's the issue. It's not the fact that um, the system disappeared in 1974 with the, with the revolution. So these explanations are inadequate. Um, and then we're into, that's looking back and trying to make a reasonable assessment. Um, but looking forward, is obviously a very difficult thing. You're telling me that the federal government uh, plans to, you know, prevent um, the, you know, an entity called Oromia from having the right to use its own language um, in government and, and teach its own language in schools. That's your political forecast. Uh, I, you know, I hope to God that you are not correct. Um, certainly there's no formal places in, in, um, in place to undermine Ethiopia's federal system as it exists in that way. I have no doubt that if there were efforts to break up Oromia um, uh, and, or if there were efforts to, you know, to strip its rights to self-determination and self-governance in that way, it would lead to further destabilization. That would be a disastrous political program. So I understand and I'm aware of the concerns that you're articulating. Um, they are not the only view about Ethiopia's political future. And ultimately, Ethiopia's political future is for all Ethiopians to fight for. It is not decided. It is not fate. Um, so that's how I would look at that situation. Thank you very much, William. I'm afraid now we do have to draw to a close. I realise that there were some people with raised hands remaining, but we are one half of an hour over time already, and we still have something up to be done by uh, Banti and by uh, Jamal. Um, William, I must say thank you very, very much for staying on for so long to um, put up with this barrage of questions and criticism. Thank you very much. Yeah, we'll, um, have, we'll, have to make, we'll have to make it a weekly thing, I think, Trevor. Yeah, uh, Mr. <laughs> Mr. William Davidson, before you go, because I, uh, I, I just have uh, advice as an old man and a pastor, okay? Uh, you have you you are there, and there is there is a problem in Europe, uh, Western countries that religious conflict is going on in Ethiopia. Be sensitive about this, and I want to give you concrete uh, uh, examples where you need to investigate. One, okay, you work with Ermia Tasfai. Er Ermia Tasfai's father is a pastor of the Ethiopian Evangelical Church, Makani Jesus. Makani Jesus in the middle. So, let me tell you then some facts. So you can ask, I'm, I'm also, I used to be a pastor of Makani Jesus Church also. So, uh, yes, I'm pastor of the Lutheran Church in Germany. Reverend Itafa Takatu Rebu, Ermia's father knows him. He was a superintendent, a pastor, in, killed in in near Tulu Wala, taken by the government soldiers and killed and thrown away. If I speak lie, you can investigate and check. Second, Makari Jesus past, uh, person, Moroda Mosa in Ambo, an 80 year old retired Makari Jesus church elder was killed by the soldiers. Okay, that's, let me leave out the Protestant part of how the Christians were killed, not by Muslims, but by the government soldiers. That's what I'm, I want to tell you. Then, 
go to Harar. Muhammad Amin, a civil servant who was imprisoned in Harar town, taken from prison, and he was beheaded and his dead body was found somewhere in Babylon. He is a Muslim, again, by the government security forces. And you, you can continue about the assassination of imams in, in uh, Shashamane, things like that. Please, in Europe, it is saying that Muslim in Ethiopia are persecuting Christians. Things are distorted here. And there are innocent people, innocent Christians who believe like that as independent person coming from Europe. Please make such concrete uh, investigations. You can ask, it is easy, Makani Jesus pastors will help you. Even you can go to Amphilo and see uh, where uh, Christians were killed and Alas, a soldier of the OLF, his parents, 80 and 60, were killed in Amphilo. I am a human rights activist, so just for your information, please come up with investigations, what I just said. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Bante. And William, uh, I, I will ask you to respond to that in a few moments, very briefly, if I may. And that will be the last contribution apart from Jamal's summing up of the whole um, conference. And I'm interrupting just to say, as Fowers asked for time to say thank you, and I banned him, I said, no, we're, we're running out of time. But he just wanted to say thank you very much and applaud your attendance in this and wanted to uh, say, he's enjoyed the conversation with you. So if you just briefly answer Banti's uh, uh, question and comment, and then we'll hand over to Jamal for the final summing up. Thank well, you. I, I, I didn't say also my final summing up of uh, thanking everybody, uh, Dr. Trevor. This, this was only the suggestion. Okay, go ahead. William? Mr. Yeah, Mr. No, I mean, I think, um, you know, I think this is, I think this is an, an, an important point. Um, you know, nar me media narratives, um, they gather, they gather pace, they're powerful. Um, there's obviously interested parties who like to play up sectarian religious conflict. Um, we've seen that, you know, with some of the exaggerated reports um, of the number of Christians who've been killed in Ethiopia. I mean, exaggerated is, is putting it polite. And it's, and it's also, you know, a, a constant narrative in Ethiopia, but an important one that needs to be remembered, um, that there's always actors who do profit from communal division um, because they get to present themselves as the responsible entity um, uh, or the moderate entity and all the rest of it. Um, so I hear you loud and clear. Um, I think we should also remember that there are genuine acts of religious sectarianism and genuine acts of intercommunal violence, um, but it is important to remember that there are other actors who would profit from creating um, that impression. Thank you very much, David. Banti, please well, be brief. Yes, th th thank you. I will, I, will, I will just make it very, very short. And I thank Ambassador Coyne and uh, Mr. William Davidson for coming and uh, giving such a very important uh, uh, lesson or education. Education. I was asking myself why we, we are preparing nowadays, Jamal and I, and Bozalal, and we are busy was preparing conferences and attending conferences. And some people were commenting that they say, uh, just forget conferences and do practice on, uh, emphasize on practical works. Well, I say, no, we have to continue with such conferences because it is education. Education, everybody can define in many things, but I like the German word for education, bildung, and build, image. So education is then not far from imagination. We all are educated, still we are uneducated at some level. 
we are educated and we have we, we, we knew how to read and write and things like that but the education system if, of Ethiopia has given us bad wrong imagination wrong image of Ethiopia within the country and in western countries Ethiopia a country that existed 3000 years ago as independent state wrong imagination image of Ethiopia confused the Westerners and they are still thinking of this they need to learn also that this is not true we all have learned it I do agree but we have all we didn't learn criticism so criticizing somebody and criticizing oneself is very common in Iraq and I appreciate that our education system in Ethiopia lacks criticism as a pastor in theologian we were not used to criticize or question the Bible in Ethiopia but here it is possible why I'm saying that my people were criticizing us for for preparing this conference and I hope this conference became very wonderful because of diversified and controversial people were here and this is the platform where we discuss things and learn from each other we have I have learned a lot we learn a lot second second Malib conference of PSC2 kana abdar gagol ni kenya warri mali bi na mayade abdalu ti ta e qabadi dani propaganda ka satron akasan bara nama munis challenge go dunus challenge go wa mu ittifu faas ni je chukot fa ya ta thank you very much everybody wa ke yundu bagi sanay bis jamal tin da barsa oromia global forum baka bu e ya da nu ke Hi, Yeba Yeganathoma, Dr. Banti. Thank you, everybody, for coming to this conference. And those of you who have presented, organized the panel, and those who participated also in the discussion, uh, Mr. William Davidson, Ambassador Herman Cohen, and uh, Professor Aswa Bayena. Uh, thank you for the ex very extensive questions and an answer session. Uh, Mr. William Davidson, I just want you to take something with you from this conference. Uh, nobody as a person is against you among the Oromos. We don't have that culture of bias against human beings just because of their identity or in whatever they believe. I think the problem why people are challenging this situation is a huge amount of bias reporting from Ethiopia when the Oromos have been discriminated for over 150 years. We don't have our own independent media. We don't have the resources. Our people are arrested, being killed every day. That is not being reported as it is, but it is being reported as if Oromos are the killers, the violentest, those who kill others are uh, based on their religion and identity. And people are very much angry about this. It is not only the action of the Ethiopian government for the last two years, it is what is happening for the last 150 years against the Oromo and other marginalized population. And uh, these people are expecting you to be the voice of really the victims, not to be on the side of those who are powerful, who are holding the power, or those, those who have been perpetrating kill, killings and uh, genocide for the last 150 years. And uh, do not take the word Naftanya literally as you talk it, like as if, if it is being against the Amhara. The, Dr. Abi, for example, is an Aftanya according to the definition of the Aftanya word itself. He is an Oromo by the background as an identity, but he's an Aftanya because an Aftanya is a gun carrier who rules people by the gun. 
That is what it means. It's nothing more than that. It has nothing to do with language, culture, religion, but it is simply the system. So please, when Oromos are, uh, uh, are uh, trying to explain the left India system as one of the most brutal systems on the world, do not associate it with Amhara. It can be an Oromo person, it can be a white person or a black who carries a gun to kill civilians to, to, to have control and rule over them. Uh, more than that, in Ethiopia, it is mostly, uh, uh, the picture is like the over 90% of the population which are under the control of the central government are the perpetrators of the killings. Please do not take side with that one. Try to find the truth going to as much as possible to the countryside. The people are very peaceful. It is really the government which is causing all this problem, the army and the uh, security forces. So we are expecting a genuine reporting from you uh, in the opposite direction of what we have experienced in Ethiopia for so many years. And we don't want you to be uh, seen as one of the enablers of the system which kills our people, which imprisons Oromo intellectuals, and which rapes Oromo women and kills ki children. So we want you to be really human, reporting what is happening in Ethiopia just the way it is. It is the poor which is being evicted from its land. Oromo farmers do not have anywhere to live today. They are becoming uh, 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 simply servants of others. They don't have any land where they can say, uh, we can feed our, uh, our kids. As you know, there is no any capital, capital over there. They don't have money. They don't have any place to live. Thousands are living outside of their homes. They don't have any, any place, any protection. We want you to report all of these grievances rather than really uh, focusing on the, the political part. The human part is what we are expecting you from people like you who had the privilege to live in the free world, who grown up with a, a huge amount of privilege and um, resources. So we want you to look at really the grievance of the poor people who, who, who cannot say anything about themselves. So take the human side of uh, what people are expecting from you not really the political side of it. That is what I would say to you. Thank you so much for being present. And with the, the controversy with Awal, it is very natural that people can have um, different uh, uh, opinions. Awal was also one of the strong supporters of Dr. Abi Ahmed's uh, government when it came to power, but he dissociated from it, it because of the brutality of the government. You can see also that part of it. That can be an education for you as an individual person because he changed his position looking at the fact is what the government is doing. And it is also okay for you to, to change your position, maybe against uh, versus Awal himself or the government too. It's okay. So uh, having said that, I wanna say a little bit about Oromia Global Forum. Oromia Global Forum for Mr. William Davidson especially. We are um, a coalition of 45, uh, about 45 Oromo organizations. Civil, uh, civic organizations, uh, 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 professional organizations, as well as religious organizations or religion-based organizations. We are civic institution which stands for the right of the Oromo people, the human right. And we, we also defend the right of the Oromo people to defend themselves by any means, uh, uh, by any means they choose. We are, not, we are not prescribing to the people to choose whether the peaceful means or any other means they, they wish. It, that, that, is, that is determined by the uh, kind of oppression they face and they choose to face it. So the second part, the third part, what, what we would support is the right of the Oromo people for self-determination as an individual as well as as a nation. So uh, we welcome you to join us, to cooperate with us on the supporting the right of the Oromo people and other marginalized populations in Ethiopia and outside of it. We would like to work with you uh, standing by for truth and for the human rights, uh, we are very well, we're very much welcome. We don't, uh, like you said, nobody is going to discriminate you because of your identity. We don't have that culture, basically. Uh, you know that uh, Oromia uh, encompasses almost, almost every nation from Ethiopia. And in Oromia, all languages are spoken. In Oromia, all religions are practiced. You don't find that in Tigray or in Amara area. So please consider the truth as facts, facts, as facts not the propaganda that is uh, uh, continuously propagated by Ethiopia, as well as it is media. You know, we don't have a lot of media. Please also stand for uh, 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 the voice of the Oromo. We don't have OMN now. Uh, and uh, Do not consider Oromo nationalism also as something very negative. It is simply the question of survival. 
we have been persecuted for the last 150 years. So we want to survive as a nation. Without that nationalism, we cannot survive. The Ethiopian government is completely against the Oromo nationalism because it wants to destroy the Oromo as a nation. So these are the messages I wish you to carry with you. And we will continue this conversation for the future and stand for truth, stand with the people, stand for humanity as human being, not really for politics, I would like to say. And for those of you who participated in this conference today, and we will be also organizing other conferences in the future. In the near future, we are going to organize a conference which is uh, going to deal about with um, genocide, continued genocide in Ethiopia for over a century, maybe for about two centuries now. And we may have also William Davidson uh, uh, to contribute uh, on that conference or to participate at least. And uh, uh, we will be announcing the date of the conference in the near future. You all are invited. Please invite your friends, anybody who you know, and we are going to work with a lot of other uh, human rights organizations, Oromo and non Oromo organizations. Please uh, uh, come to, the, to our meetings and conferences. With this, I would like to end my remarks. Uh, thank you, everybody, for participating, for being so wonderful, uh, and for the organizers also for coordinating such a wonderful uh, uh, conference. And other human rights organizations, please join this team. Thank you so much. I conclude with this and give it back to Dr. Uh, Trevor Truman. Thank you. Thank you, Jamal. I wasn't expecting to speak again. I, well, I would reiterate the thanks to everybody who's attended, it, especially William. Thank you very much. And thank you for bearing with us for so long after the allotted time span, William. Right, well, good night to everyone and thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, William. All right, bye bye now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.